Are you ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live from the Newsmax studios, this is the Steve Malzberg Show. Be a part of the action by calling 855-777-9660. That's 855-777-9660. Or email Steve at malzbergshow at newsmax.com. Here is Steve Malzberg. Welcome, everyone. I'm David Nelson. This is the Steve Malsberg Show. I'm filling in for Steve today. We have a great show for you uh, today and all this week. But before I walk you through some of the great guests we're going to have this week, I got to take you through some of the news items that happened late last week through the weekend so you understand better how you can be better pre prepared for this week. So we're going to talk about all these things. The number one lead story that I've got to talk about is uh, really President Obama. He continues to be out on the campaign trail. Ha has anybody told this guy that he actually won the election? It's not necessary to com campaign right now. He's also sent a memo out, and obviously everybody in the administration, because everywhere I turn, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, Fox News, I was hearing the following words, phony scandal, phony scandal, phony scandal. Everything is a phony scandal. IRS, phony scandal. Is Benghazi a phony scandal? What about the NSA? Well, I'd like to learn about the IRS. We've been seeing that for several weeks. So later on in this hour, we're going to talk to somebody who knows about it. We're going to talk to Congressman Mike Kelly. The congressman is from Pennsylvania, sits on the House Ways and, House and Ways Means Committee. We're going to find out from the congressman what's about to happen next and what they're doing to prevent this kind of thing in the future. A little later on uh, in, the, uh, in the program, you're going to learn how to find some sunken treasure. Think it's hard. All you really need is a couple of hundred million dollars worth of equipment, uh, nerves of steel, decades of experience. But we're going to talk to Mike Gordon. Mike is the chief operating officer of Odyssey Marine, and they have found 61 million tons of silver on the ocean's floor. Uh, he's going to tell us how, he, how they did it. And uh, I think he's going to tell us that there's a lot more down there. So let's find out about that. And then the one that everybody is talking about, we're going to have Victoria Jackson. You probably all remember her. She was that ditzy blonde on Saturday Night Live in, in the 1980s. And you've got to remember from that time period, the mid-1980s, that was really the primo time for uh, Saturday Night Live. You had Dennis Miller. You had Eddie Murphy. You had Jim Belushi. You really had the cream of the crop back then, but she has gone all the way from Hollywood to the Tea Party, and she recently was on a show on Fox News, just blew the socks off. Do you all remember, Victoria, that, that inverted V split uh, where you could see the American flag? And uh, it was quite a scene with Dennis Miller uh, saluting the American flag, but I've got that video, video for you a little bit later. The other story, that I'd like to talk about on a more serious note. You know, over the last several weeks, uh, we've been all dealing with the Zimmerman trial, the results of the Zimmerman trial, and it's, it's created what I would call a, um, a conversation, right? Last week, there was a huge uproar uh, over O'Reilly's show. He gave out a memo. He gave his thoughts on the African community and what they should do. Uh, I, it was a little bit shocking, but I must admit, I agreed with Bill O'Reilly. There was something I wouldn't have said. I'm a white person, I'm a white journalist, and I was afraid to say these things. And then on CNN this past weekend, I saw uh, an African-American host, Don Lemon. He was on CNN, and uh, he had this to say. Let's go to cut six. But now that the jury has reached his verdict, one that everyone must accept, it's time now for some tough love on the subject. The reason there is so much violence and chaos in the black precincts is the disintegration of the African-American family. He's got a point. In fact, he's got more than a point. Bill? Raised without much structure, young black men often reject education and gravitate towards the street culture, drugs, hustling, gangs. Nobody forces them to do that. Again, it is a personal decision. He is right about that, too. But in my estimation, he doesn't go far enough. 
That blew my socks off, that statement. And it, it's something that I think a lot of people believe and are frankly just afraid to say. Don Lemon uh, had five points that he wanted to impress upon uh, young uh, black children, things that they can do to improve their lives. Let's take a look at uh, Cut Five. Because black people, if you really want to fix the problem, here's just five things that you should think about doing. Here's number five. And if, if, if this doesn't apply to you, if you're not doing this, then it doesn't apply to you. I'm not talking about you. Here's number five. Pull up your pants. Number four now is the N-word. Now number three. Respect where you live. Number two. Finish school. And number one, and probably the most important, just because you can have a baby, it doesn't mean you should. That probably shook up a lot of people, those statements. The first one in, in, in particular that I, I happen to agree with, you know, pull up your pants. You know? He points out in that video that uh, what it comes from, it comes from prison. Uh, prisoners are forced to take out their, their belts, their pants fall down, and you know what? The one with the lowest pants, he's the submissive one in a male-to-male -male sexual relationship. All right, coming up in the next segment, we're going to have Mike Kelly, congressman from Pennsylvania. We're going to be talking about the IRS. We're going to have a good time today. It's going to be a good show. You're listening to The Steve Malsberg Show. I'm David Nelson. The Steve Malsberg Show. In 2013, half of your friends, family, and neighbors may lose their jobs, all while you are robbed of 90% of your life savings, investments, and home's value. Controversial economist Robert Wiedemer, who was the only expert to predict the recession, has released a startling video with shocking evidence that the powers that be have tried to ban. But that hasn't stopped 50 million people from getting the truth. Watch it at Aftershock911.com. Aftershock911.com. What is Lignet? Lignet is knowledge. Lignet is power. Lignet is global. Top level officials, U.S. intelligence officers, national security advisors, foreign operatives, all reporting directly to you. What is Lignet? Lignet is confidential. Lignet is sensitive. Lignet is security. What is Lignet? They're the ones taking the world's pulse. If you're not in the know, you're not on Lignet.com. You've been briefed. This is the worst weather we've seen in quite some time, folks, and I don't see any end in sight. People have been calling in from across the state complaining their basements are flooding. One guy said he now has an indoor swimming pool in his basement. I told him he needs the waterproofing innovations from basement systems. If you want a dry basement or crawl space that will weather any kind of storm, you need the patented solutions from basement systems. You've seen them on home makeover shows throughout the country. With a lifetime warranty, every solution is custom designed for your basement. You can finally have that room you've always wanted with our total basement finishing system. Call now for a free estimate and you'll never have to worry about storms like these again. Call now for your free basement inspection at 800-516-9794, 800-516-9794. Learn how to waterproof your basement now. Call this number, 800-516-9794, 800-516-9794. Judging from everything you hear, you think all cholesterol is bad, but that's not really true. You need a certain amount of cholesterol to maintain good health. The problem is that too much cholesterol in your blood contributes to a plaque, a fatty substance that narrows the coronary arteries that feed blood flow to your heart. Picture your coronary arteries as a four-lane highway. If one lane becomes blocked, traffic still flows well. Two lanes, no major problem. But if a third lane becomes blocked, that spells trouble. It's the same way with your coronary arteries. And when plaque slows their blood flow to your heart, this can even cause a heart attack. The good news is that when it comes to cholesterol, lifestyle changes can pay off big time. Even a small reduction in plaque can be like opening up another highway lane. Suddenly, blood flow that was stalled can go forward again. Changing your lifestyle does not have to be hard. And in fact, here are three ways to help you start lowering your cholesterol. Snack on nuts. Nuts are probably one of the easiest and tastiest ways to lower cholesterol. Walnuts and almonds are among the best. Bulk up your diet with fiber. 
choose whole fruits instead of a fruit juice, brown rice instead of white, and if you're eating a baked potato, be sure to leave the skin on. Choose fish. Fish contains cholesterol-fighting omega-3 fatty acids. I'm Dr. Chauncey Crandall, and thanks for watching this Heart Health Minute. Remember, it's never too late to prevent or reverse heart disease. Right now, I invite you to discover your own risk for heart disease or even a heart attack by taking my quick, free online quiz at www.simpleheartest.com. Where can you find the Steve Malzberg Show? Everywhere. From your smartphone to satellite radio to Newsmax Live TV to Roku, we have you covered. Here is Steve Malzberg. Phony scandals that have consumed so much attention here, uh, all to come to naught. He's not focused on, you know, pretend scandals. Some phony scandals that have... Uh uh, captured the attention of many here in Washington, fake scandals uh, or things like that. We have to keep focused on uh, the North Star here, the issues that the American people want us to be focused on. It looks like everybody's uh, getting the memo. The president, of course, is out on the campaign trail, and he's trying to change the rhetoric. He's certainly trying to get his staff to change the rhetoric, and he's trying to get this term phony scandal out there and, and, and try to get us to think about something else. Is it a phony scandal? I, I don't think so. Uh, just this past Sunday, uh, Fox News host Chris Wallace really took it to Secretary of Treasury Jack Lew. He was trying to get a, him to ask a, answer a very specific question, and he was asking about IRS uh, Chief Counsel William Wilkins. Take a look at this. Have you asked William Wilkins, the IRS Chief Counsel appointed by President Obama, what involvement he or his office had in all of this. No, Chris, uh, to be clear, there are 1,600 lawyers in the chief counsel's office, and there was no suggestion that this went to the one political uh, person in that office. There's no evidence of it. There has been well, no I, evidence of it. Well, wait a minute. I, I, have you asked him? Chris, I, I, I am leaving the investigation to the proper people who do investigations. I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to do the investigation. Somebody, there are somebody in the Treasury Department asked somebody in the Treasury Department. There are a lot of questions being asked. 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 Asked William Wilkins what he knew about this. Chris, there is no evidence that this went to any political official. Phony scandals that have cons I don't think uh, Chris Wallace got what he was, uh, you know, trying to get. He certainly didn't get an answer. Joining us to fill us in on the IRS investigation is Congressman Mike Kelly of Pennsylvania. He serves on the House Ways and Means Committee. Congressman, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Well, David, thanks for having me on. And uh, I'll tell you what, this is one more example of, a, uh, of an administration that pledged to have the most, the most transparent and clear administration ever. One thing, when I, Jack, uh, Jack Lukey, so to be clear, here's, here's what we can hear. When they say to be clear, what they mean is to be clear. We will never answer a question that you ask us. To be clear, don't ask me that question. I'm going to give you the runaround. Now, here's a guy that says he's going to let the investigators do their, their job, but by the same token, uh, he's sure that nothing's reached uh, the level that there's any concern. These people are always the same. Let's move on. Nothing going on here. This is imaginary. These are Republicans trying to start a scandal that isn't there. My goodness, I have never seen in my 65 years uh, an administration so mired done with more unaccountable, uh, unaccountability, with more scandals, uh, real-life scandals, and no way to answer them. So their way to answer is you just don't answer. You move on to something else. You refuse to answer. Uh, and i got to tell you, the, the, this IRS thing is not going away. We've got more and more people coming forward. They're becoming emboldened. They know that they're going to be protected, that we've got their backs. But think about this. This has been so chilling for most people because they know these folks are in every single part of our life. My gosh, they're trying to get in our health care now. We've got to try and stop that. But everything these folks touch, they have in-depth information. They can, uh, they, they can just destroy you as an individual or as a business. If anything else, and there's people that, 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 that play cards. You, know, you have to keep up every time they do something. You can't afford it. I, I want to touch on something because you just mentioned it. Because uh, you know, we all know that the IRS is now responsible for a big part of the mandate of Obamacare. Right. How are they going to deal with all this? You know, they, they have their own issues, and now, now they're supposed to run Obamacare. My confidence level is very low here. Well, my, my confidence level is not low. It's, it's past the E. I'm past the red zone now. I'm past the E. Listen, I, I would just say that most of us uh, that are paying attention, and unfortunately, 
Not everybody is. I'm not criticizing people. I'm just saying this is the way it is. And a lot of people don't pay attention anymore. They're more concerned with other things going on in their life. But this is a case where you don't want them any deeper. Look, they've already proved the level of incompetency that they're at. We don't want them messing with anything else. And the data that they're collecting, David, the information they're going to have on us, the navigators that they're hiring, and they're going to pay these folks. I think I don't, like, I don't have the, the, uh, the number in my head right now, but it is thousands and thousands of people that they call them navigators. And these are help people to get signed up for this health care bill. You're going to give them information. They're, getting, they're being paid a spiff, a bonus, $58 a person that they sign up. And they grant, they so there's a real incentive here to do that. Uh, you know, it brings up a question that I have, and, and a lot of people that know, know me, and, I, and I'm on this show, and I, I'm a visible person, I get to talk to a lot of people like yourself, I get to talk to some of the brightest people on the planet, and one thing I'm not getting an answer to, how is it that former IRS head Lois Lerner can take the fifth, and yet we're all still paying her salary? Well, do you know what? We, we're trying to put a piece through, and this week is... Uh, uh, Stop a Government Abuse Week. We have a piece, on a piece of legislation that is the Government uh, Employee Accountability Act that is going to allow people to be actually fired. But when you look at the way this business, the, the government's run, it is absolutely astounding. But the things that we do in the private sector, the efforts that we go to to protect our businesses and our, our families and stuff, it does not exist in the government. Lois Lerner will be redeployed. She's, played, she's put on the on leave with pay. Uh, Neely from the uh, GSA, the same thing. Leave with pay. pay. They don't lose any vacation time. They don't lose any pension dollars. They don't lose any other revenue. They don't lose anything. What they, what, what the country has lost, is its faith in the way this government. Well, is how about a clawback? Day what, after day. What about oh, a clawback, Congressman? I mean, let's, you know, she, she's not convicted of anything. Obviously, she's taking the fifth. Uh, but what about a clawback if we actually find some wrongdoing? Can anything be done there? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what we're trying to do right now, this week, we're going to be really focusing on it again. Uh, this uh, Stop Government Abuse Week, we're going to be instituting very simple, common-sense things that are done in the private sector that are not done in the public sector. We're going to start holding people accountable for wrong deal, deal, dealings and malfeasance. We're going to have the ability to actually fire people or institute the things to fire people for wrongdoing and, and uh, absconding with funds and doing the things all of us in the private sector would be held accountable for and help responsible for. We're going to do the same thing with the federal uh, people, and not painting everybody with the same brush, okay? I don't mean to do that, but I do say this. Look, when there is absolutely no accountability, zero accountability, when you complete the fifth and walk out, and that's not just Lois Lerner's other members of the IRS, and know that you're not going to get hurt with anything. They don't get hurt with one single thing. They walk through these things like walking through a bed of, of hot coals with heavy uh, insulated boots on. The rest of us have to follow the law. Some she question, Congressman, not. whether or not she could even take the fifth, because she made a statement prior to taking the fifth. Doesn't that even open up a whole legal ground here that she shouldn't be allowed to take it? It does. It does. And, and I think the, the, the one thing I think, David, we want to concentrate on is as much as we would like this to move quicker, and as much as the administration would like to shove it out of the way altogether, it's going to be a very thoughtful and it's going to be a progressive piece that we do as we look into and add that, uh, all, all that we can to make sure that people understand we have vetted it, we have found these things to be true. We're not just shooting from the hip and making false statements. We're trying to protect you, Mr. and Mrs. American citizen, from a government that has grown way too big, way too arrogant. All right, those are broad strokes, Congressman. Better. Those are broad strokes. I'd like to yes. go to some specifics. What are you sure. doing right now? What are some next steps that can be taken in this investigation? Well, I, again, uh, we're having people come forward right now, the, the people that we, some people would call whistleblowers. We're, we're getting their information. We're looking at all the, uh, the – a lot of this is going to come through emails. Uh, the staff is not really big on the ways and means that we're looking at. We do have the ability to ask for information. We get it very sparingly. We get it very, uh, you know, at the, at the last minute. We will continue to pour through that and look at it. Here's the thing, I think. The most Americans, again, I said earlier, they would like to see it happen faster. It can't happen faster. It has to happen this way. First of all, we're very limited in what we can do in the, in the House. But we can do the investigation. We can do the exposure. David, you and I both know. When we're done with that, it gets passed on to the Department of Justice. They have stonewalled us on every single Let thing, me ask you this, issue. Congressman. What about immunity? I mean, that usually spurs things along. Uh, we've talked, you know, in the financial yep. world, you get yep. people to roll over by offering immunity. What about that? Yep. 
why I think that's on the table, and I think that's part of what we're doing right now in investigations, because we do know that it always starts out at the lower level, and it keeps going up and up and up. Now, you've got some of these people are very vulnerable, so you've got to assure them, look, you can come forward. You can get this problem fixed. We will work with you, and we will get this information, and we will be able to work forward with that information. So immunity, of course, is part of it. It's part of every investigation. Well, Congressman, keep up the good work. We'll see how this unfolds. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with that was, of course, Congressman Mike Kelly of uh, Congressman from Pennsylvania talking about the IRS uh, scandal. Let me uh, tell you my thoughts just real, real quickly on this. More has to be done on this. This is very, this in, invades the fabric of our lives. So I want to see more done on this. Coming up in the next segment, we're going to talk about the economy, the markets. Markets are hitting all-time highs. It's uh, been pretty exciting for those of us in the, mar in the stock market. Uh, I don't know. I talk to a lot of clients out there. They're very nervous about this market. Uh, we keep pushing higher. And frankly, some of the metrics that we're seeing in the economy are not all that great. Earnings are coming in, I would say, OK. Revenue has been tepid. In, case, in some cases, a lot of misses on the revenue side. So we're going to talk to an expert. We're going to talk to Matt Van Alstyne. He's the co-founder of Odeon Capital Group. I'm getting a cue from my room. We got how much time? Okay, all right, a uh, couple other things. Let me just go back, let me just backtrack a second uh, you know, to what the congressman was, uh, was, was, was talking about there. The Lois Lerner thing really gets me. Uh, you know, they're, they're giving her uh, immunity, and uh, I don't think she should be allowed to take it. She actually spoke uh, before uh, you know, taking that immunity. That, that closes out the, uh, that closes out the, uh, you know, the, you know, the the game for her. She should actually uh, be forced to testify. I think she will be forced to testify. That's my two cents on that. I wanted to throw that in. We had a, a, a little bit more time. Again, we have Matt von Alstein uh, coming up in the next group from the Odeon Capital Group. We're going to talk about the economy. You're listening to The Steve Malsberg Show. I'm David Nelson. The Steve Malsberg Show. Hi, this is Mike Reagan. Folks ask me, what would Ronald Reagan do if he were with us today? I believe the first thing he'd do is stop Obamacare. Already it's in effect with higher taxes, hidden fees, skyrocketing insurance rates, big Medicare cuts, and some insurance plans are hit with a 40% tax. Protect yourself by getting the Obamacare Survival Guide. It's already a number one New York Times bestseller. Newsmax says it's the best guide to the new law, giving you the strategies, tips, and loopholes you need to know. If you're insured on Medicare, a business owner, a medical professional, just about anyone, you need this book. Get the number one bestseller, The Obamacare Survival Guide, at bookstores everywhere. Or get our special $4.95 offer and save $15 off the cover price by going now to Obamacare911.com. Obamacare911.com. That's Obamacare911.com. If you need to lose weight and would like to get paid for it, that's right, I said get paid to lose weight. Just listen to the following announcement. The makers of GCE Green Coffee Bean Weight Loss are looking for real testimonials from real people and will pay you per pound to meet or exceed your weight loss goal. Until now, the secrets of Green Coffee's fat-burning power has been limited. But thanks to Dr. Oz, the secret is out. And now, this authentic Green Coffee Bean Fat Burner is available in easy-to-take tablets. There are no expensive meals to buy or strenuous workouts. Simply take one tablet before each meal and record your progress. Only the first 200 callers are guaranteed to be accepted into the program. So if you're serious about losing extra weight and want to earn extra cash for fitting into your skinny jeans again, call 800-383-9230 now. Call 800-383-9230. 800-383-9230. Space is limited, so hurry and secure your spot today. 800-383-9230. Some conditions apply. 800-383-9230. 800-383-9230. This is a referral service. Calls will be routed to an independent referral insurance agency. Do you know the number one cause of bankruptcy? No, it's not losing your job or running up credit card debt. It's not even divorce. It's medical costs. 
If you and your family don't have health insurance, just one serious illness or accident could be financially devastating. But now there's good news, really good news. A health insurance hotline has been established to provide health insurance for all Americans, even uninsured Americans with pre-existing conditions. Now anyone can get health insurance even if you have a pre-existing medical condition. I repeat, now anyone can get health insurance coverage. Call now for a free no-obligation quote on affordable health plans available to you. Again, this is a free hotline for anyone, even if you have pre-existing conditions. Protect you and your family from sudden unexpected medical costs. Call the free health insurance hotline right now at 1-800-910-3470. That's 1-800-910-3470. Call 1-800-910-3470. Attention hip implant patients. Are you in constant pain? Have you received a letter from your doctor about your implant? Have you had or need a revision surgery? Do you have high levels of metal, chromium, or cobalt in your blood? Over 90,000 hip implant devices have been recalled due to defects and failures resulting in revision or replacement surgery. If you have a recalled hip implant, you may be entitled to substantial financial compensation. Call 800-460-0920 to see if your implant is affected by the recalls. If you or a loved one has a defective or recalled hip implant, you may be entitled to substantial financial compensation. Call 800-460-0920. That's 800-460-0920. Protect your legal rights today. Call 800-460-0920. This is an advertisement, not valid in all states. Paid non-attorney spokesperson. iLawsuit.com is an advertising group that represents lawyers advertising their services and is a free matching service for consumers. It is not a law firm or lawyer referral service. This is not your typical Scream Fest talk show. No. 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 This is the next generation of talk radio. Here is Steve Malsberg. Welcome back, everyone. I'm David Nelson. Uh, This is, of course, the Steve Malsberg Show, and I'm filling in for uh, Steve today. The markets have been hitting all-time highs. It's been pretty exciting for those of us in the markets. Some people are pretty nervous out here. We're getting mixed signals from the Fed. Let's talk to an expert. Let's talk to... Uh, Matt Van Alstyne, he's from the Odeon Capital Group, and he's with us right here in the studio. Matt, thank you for being with us today. Glad to be here. Matt, uh, you're a chartered financial analyst uh, like myself, uh, so I know you've done the hard work here. Here we are, all-time highs for the market. We seem to keep pushing higher. Walk me through your thought process. Are we going higher or not? Well, I think we're going to continue going higher as long as the Fed continues buying bonds. They've hinted that they're going to end tapering or begin tapering their purchases, but they're still purchasing. And as long as that continues, I think that there's a dearth of asset classes for people to invest in. And that leads them to invest in stocks and leads the markets to all-time highs. If this is a Fed-led market, then we're obviously very dependent on on Ben Bernanke. And I remember the markets got spooked back, uh, I believe it was June, the FOMC meeting. We really took a dive. And then one by one, we had a Fed governor after Fed governor kind of walk back those comments. And then, lo and behold, uh, a couple of weeks later, even, even Chairman uh, Bernanke came out and said, we're kind of in this for the long term. Which is it? You know, are they unwinding QE or, or are they going to just keep pressing on? Exactly. That's the problem the market has. I think, I mean, if you go back many years, this is actually the third or fourth summer season in a row where the Fed has tried to end their direct involvement in keeping the economy afloat. And then you, that's why you've had QE1 and QE2. You know, QE1 was originally named quantitative easing because there wasn't supposed to be a two. Then there was QE2 and then obviously QE3. And QE3, There, some people think there's even been QE4 because of how they walked back the end of QE3. So every time they come on the brink of, you know, ending their involvement in the markets, um, the markets scare them back into continuing it. They, they get scared, but, you know, the bond markets uh, really took a dive. And for a lot of our viewers out there, a lot of people need safe investments. They were really hammered after, after that Fed meeting. Uh, interest rates are still very low, and, and some say the Fed has really hurt savers, uh, especially seniors who rely on things like CDs. They don't have a choice. They're being forced into the stock market, maybe at a time when it's a little bit too dangerous. What kind of signal they, do you need for your investors to say, no mas, I'm out of here? Well, in the stock market, um, it would be the Fed walking away 
walking away, beginning tapering. But haven't they set up the beginning of the end of, of that right now? If I they mean, mean it. Well, it, do they mean it, or are they telling us the truth or not? Um, it seems like he mean, Ben Bernanke means it this time. I mean, his term is ending. Uh, Mr. Obama made it clear he didn't want him back. So he's going to be setting up his successor with a legacy. And I suspect that he doesn't want that legacy to be immediately ending everything that he put in place, and he'd probably want to commence it before he leaves. All right, that brings up an important point, because the two names that are, that are being brought up are, of course, Janet Yellen, uh, who's currently there, and, uh, and a name from the past, a name we haven't heard for a long time, Larry Summers. Seems like a very political move on the president's uh, part. Any ideas who's likely to be the next uh, chairman? Well, if it's either of those two, they're actually quite disparate in what supposedly they would do. Um, Larry Summers is definitely a partisan Democrat who would probably act in the best interest of the Democrat Gee, Party. Gee, I, I wonder why Larry Summers' name is coming up here. But I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just, I think, but Janet Yellen's been at the Fed for 20-something years and has supported all of Ben Bernanke's moves. So you might see more consistency if she's named than, than Larry Summers. When I talk to market professionals, they seem to lean towards Janet Yellen. Uh, she's been there. She's a banker. Uh, and Larry is very much a political political animal. How do you think the markets will react if Larry Summers, Summers is named the, the new chairman of the Fed? Well, the markets just want transparency. They want predictability. So if he's named, I don't know if it, that in and of itself is a disaster for the markets as long as he gets you know, confirmed in a rapid fashion and is in clairvoyant into what he wants to do. Let me take it back to the markets uh, for a second because we are in the middle of e earnings seasons and one of the big driving forces for markets is not even just the United States. It's outside uh, outside our markets, and in, pr I'm, in principle, I'm, I'm talking about China. We've seen a dramatic slowdown in China, and that seems to have riled our markets because, in fact, we sell to these Asian countries. And I sometimes question how are you, how are U.S. multinational companies doing so well if the emerging markets, led by China, are actually slowing down? Uh, the emerging markets haven't done well at all this year. China seems to be. Uh, really hitting the skids right now. What does that mean for our market? Well, there, there's two different things. The markets are one thing, but it's actual consumer activity where we, where American companies sell their goods into emerging market company, and emerging market um, consumers. And the consumer market has not gone nearly as poorly as the stock markets in the emerging market. So as long as we're selling our goods at a competitive price, you know, we'll do just fine. And the dollar's been helping because it's been relatively weak. All right. Uh, let's get some tips here. What do you like in this market right now? Maybe a sector or even a stock pick or an ETF? Well, we like the coal sector right now. It's been the coal, hold on. Stop the presses here. The coal sector, this has been decimated, the coal sector. Yep, correct. It's been decimated. But we think it's near the bottoms and um, the, the, the internals will come back pretty strong. I think it got hit also because of fear of the EPA overreach, but it seems like that's not going to be the case. Yeah, but let me take you to Washington for a second. I mean, you, you have an administration that's almost dedicated their presidency to driving this sector in, in, into, into the ground. They're, you know, very beholden to the green energy lobby. Uh, coal is certainly not a, a super clean fuel, and we hear words like clean coal. We know there's probably no such thing as clean coal. It's a dirty fuel, no question about it. How are they going to buck up against, you know, a democratic administration? Well, it's interesting when ideals meet facts. The fact is that a good portion of our electricity in the United States comes from coal, and we don't have any ready alternatives. So if you destroyed the coal industry, you're destroying the entire U.S. economy and the entire in electrical infrastructure of the U.S. economy. Well, then walk me through this, uh, because I, over the last couple of years, I've seen a lot of uh, you know, elect uh, electric utilities actually start to transition from coal to natural gas, we seem to have an abundance of natural gas as well. Yeah, that's true. And natural gas is likely going to continue to be the the uh, new um, factory of choice or the new electrical production f plant of choice. Well, Boom Pickens would like that. He's been pushing his uh, his plan for for a pretty long time. But you know, we seem to be able to. You know, it seems to be there. And I guess the question is, you know, will we put the energy policies in place? to become energy in independent. I actually saw something just recently uh, today. It, it kind of struck me. I may even talk about it a little, a little later. Uh, uh, Prince Alawid uh, from Saudi Arabia saying that fracking, in fact, is uh, destroying the amount of oil that they're able to sell. I think that's a good thing, isn't it? Isn't it? 
uh, that it's destroying the Saudi Arabians? Yeah, I mean, why, why, look at if we can produce more oil, isn't that a good thing for us? Oh, I think energy independence is a, an ideal that the, the American well, people have been chasing for I would quite some time. think natural gas, fracking, and all these things, including coal, would be part of that equation. Uh, I'm not sure we have an energy policy in, in place to do that. But let me go to another topic, because I don't want to just talk about stocks, because frankly, stocks are not really appropriate for everybody. What can somebody listening at home right now, elderly, need some steady income, an alternative to fixed income, anything income producing? Well, I think fixed income is a good alternative to stocks. But how do you do that without losing your capital, given that what interest rates are doing? Well, you don't lose your capital when you buy bonds. The actual the benefit of a, of a corporate bond is you get, Talk about that. Explain why you don't lose your capital if you buy the individual bond. It's important. Because you get your capital returned to you at the date of maturity of the bond. So there's, there's a bunch of bonds. I mean, the bond market's bigger than the stock market if you include treasuries. Um, and you go out, you buy the bond, and you pick a maturity date, and you get your coupon plus your principal back on the end of maturity as long as it doesn't default. So it comes down to picking companies that are, you know, have strong balance sheets and good prospects. But the difference between the stock market and the bond market is the the return or the you know promised return of capital. The big mistake, sorry, the go ahead, big no, go mistake ahead. investors yeah. make is by buying bond funds That's what I wanted or to by hear. buying okay. ETFs and thinking that they're getting exposure to the high yield market. If you're buying an ETF, you're getting day-to-day -day movement or you're capturing that. That's not owning bonds. If you're buying a bond fund, you're relying on the bond manager to be prudent, which is a little bit safer than the ETFs, but you still have to sell. I think that brings up a, a very important point, the difference between a bond fund and, and, a, and a bond is that in the bond you do get your money your money back. It brings up another type of bond. We're going to be talking about this uh, later in our program. We're going to be talking about Detroit, and we've seen what's happened in the municipal market. You know, Detroit going into bankruptcy is a serious event. Have you seen you know eruptions within the municipal market? Oh yeah, the municipal market's gotten crushed, but it started getting crushed before Detroit filed it. It began with the Fed's comments on tapering. Um, for some reason, but all, bond, all bonds got crushed during correct, that. Correct, but uh, the junk bond market, high yield bonds, and investment grade bond market have come back a lot faster than the municipal bond. It's still it's now trailing where it used to be versus it, those. It brings up an important issue because in in Detroit, if the bondholders get crushed in a bankruptcy like this, doesn't this translate to every other municipality out there? If this works for Detroit, a bankruptcy. Why can't I do it too? Because there's a lot, a lot of them that are on the edge. And my question is, what does it mean for the healthy cities that have to go back to the, to the capital markets? What are they going to do to raise capital? Well, rates are going to be higher. I mean, but that's probably the nature of the market anyway. I, it's hard to compare every city because each city is different. It's municipal leadership. If you have it and you have responsible mayors and city councils and and the like, then you're less likely to have this problem. <laughs> if you have irresponsibility like Detroit had, they had 20 years of single party leadership. I don't think there's been a Republican city councilman there in decades. Um, you're right, you're right, of course. And Matt, very well said. We're gonna have to have you back again soon, Matt. Thank you so much for being with us, we appreciate it. Great being here, thanks. We've been talking with Matt Van Alstyne uh, from the Odeon Capital Group. Uh, we've got a great show coming up for you. You're listening to the Steve Malsberg Show. I'm David Nelson. The Steve Malsberg Show. Attention, if you've been classified as a high-risk driver due to DUI, DWI, or tickets for aggressive driving and are required to get expensive and hard-to-find SR-22 auto insurance, then you must listen to this message because we can help. We're the largest insurance company in the U.S. specializing in SR-22 auto insurance and focused on serving the needs of customers classified by the state as high-risk drivers. We help people get back on their feet by providing easy-to-get, low-cost SR-22 insurance that anyone can afford. If you you need SR-22 auto insurance, or if you have it now and are paying too much, you need to call us today for your free quote at 800-836-4606. Our specialists are standing by waiting for your call. We understand people make mistakes, and we're here to help by making SR-22 insurance easy to get and affordable for everyone. The call and quote are free. Call us now at 800-836-4606. That's 800-836-4606. Again, 800-836-4606. Do you owe the IRS? Do you have unfiled tax returns? Have you received a wage garnishment or bank levy? Maybe a lien has been filed against you. 
OMG Tax can help you with all your IRS tax problems. Don't wait another second. Take action now. Call my team at OMG Tax. Honest and professional, we don't make false promises. If you owe back taxes or if the IRS is garnishing your paycheck, you need help now. OMG Tax can help you get your life back to normal. If you're serious about handling your tax matter, call OMG Tax now and get the peace of mind you deserve. Don't let the IRS take your next paycheck. Stop waiting and call our team at OMG Tax. OMG Tax has a straightforward, no-nonsense approach and has helped many Americans resolve their IRS nightmare. Call OMG Tax now. Call 1-800-255-6485. That's 1-800-255-6485. 800-255-6485. Drug, alcohol, and gambling addiction can be devastating for you and your loved ones. Don't let the disease of addiction ruin everything you've worked so hard for. The Treatment Helpline has helped thousands of people just like you take control of their addictions and live healthier, cleaner, and happier lives. You are not alone. Now there's hope. The Treatment Helpline has helped people just like you overcome their addiction. If you or a loved one is suffering from a drug, alcohol, or gambling addiction, let us help you today. Call 1-800-813-9821. Our seasoned addiction treatment professionals can show you how to use your private health insurance to help cover the costs of this life-changing program. Call now and get a free confidential consultation. 1-800-813-9821. That's 1-800-813-9821. Help is only a phone call away. Call 1-800-813-9821. That's 1-800-813-9821. Hi, this is Mike Reagan. Folks ask me, what would Ronald Reagan do if he were with us today? I believe the first thing he'd do is stop Obamacare. Already it's in effect with higher taxes, hidden fees, skyrocketing insurance rates, big Medicare cuts, and some insurance plans are hit with a 40% tax. Protect yourself by getting the Obamacare Survival Guide. It's already a number one New York Times bestseller. Newsmax says it's the best guide to the new law, giving you the strategies, tips, and loopholes you need to know. If you're insured on Medicare, a business owner, a medical professional, just about anyone, you need this book. Get the number one bestseller, The Obamacare Survival Guide, at bookstores everywhere. Or get our special $4.95 offer and save $15 off the cover price. Scroll down now to claim your copy of Obamacare Survival Guide for the special Internet offer of only $4.95. 150 million people suffer from headaches. All you want is for the pounding in your head to stop. Migralex stops the pounding. Migralex was developed by a neurologist and founder of the New York Headache Center. I'm neurologist Dr. Alex Mauskop. After studying and researching the human brain for 25 years, I've developed Migralex, which eliminates pounding headaches. It works for my patients, and I'm so convinced it will work for you. I don't just guarantee it. I put my name on it. Dr. Mauskop's Migralex gets rid of headaches fast without harsh caffeine, sodium, or preservatives. Migralex works unbelievably fast. And it's gentle on my stomach. Find out how to get your free bottle of Migralex. Call 800-532-2967. Plus, if you're one of the first 100 callers, you'll also receive the Migralex Quick Tips to Headache Relief absolutely free. That's 800-532-2967. Or go to MigralexRelief.com. M-I-G-R-A-L-E-X Relief.com. Or call 800-532-2967. The Steve Malzberg Show is just a bit different from the other radio shows. We have TV cameras. Watch the show at Newsmax.com or listen on your favorite radio station. Here's Steve Malzberg. Welcome back, everyone. I'm David Nelson. I'm filling in for Steve. This is, of course, the Steve Malzberg Show. You know, we spent an awful lot of time over the last several months talking about Obamacare. But somehow what gets lost in, in the sauce here is there are other programs out there, other health care initiatives that are very important out there. And principally, I'm talking about Medicare and Medicaid. And we're now getting evidence right now that some doctors are actually starting to walk, walk away from both of these programs. Now, what does this mean 
really for the people that depend on these programs. Medicare is very important to the senior community, and certainly Medicaid is as well. So joining us to share her views on this subject is Grace Marie Turner. Grace is a president of the Galleon Institute, and he joins us by phone. Grace Marie, thank you so much for taking the time today. David, pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Grace, I, I read in the journal this morning uh, an important article that was out there that the number of doctors that are walking away from Medicare and also Medicaid is climbing dramatically. Walk us through your thought process here. What do you think? Well, we've been seeing this coming since before Obamacare passed. And you're right, David. Obamacare really is an effort to create new insurance coverage, both through for private coverage through the exchanges as well as Medicaid expansion. But a, there's a huge, huge impact on Medicare for seniors, including $716 billion that has to come out of Medicare to pay for this expanded coverage for other Americans. Seniors have known this was going to impact their access to coverage. Part of it is cuts in payment rates to physicians, cuts in payment to Medicare Advantage programs, these coordinated care programs particularly popular with senior citizens, but also the enormous amount of paperwork that all doctors that participate in any public health care program, Medicare, Medicaid, and now the exchanges, will have to fill out in order to comply. They And they are under serious legal regulations and, and, and restrictions on what they can do. Many of them are now saying they want to get out of Medicare, not only because the payment rates are falling, but also because of the the threat that they see to confidenti confidentiality of patient medical records. Well, that brings and up a whole other issue, uh, Grace of Marie. Complying. Let, let me ask you this, because does this also translate, is Obamacare also affecting Medicaid as well? Because I, I'm reading right here a study in the journal uh, Health Affairs this month that 33% of primary care physicians didn't accept new Medicaid patients. Is this all part of the same package, or is this a separate issue? Well, Medicaid, of course, is also being expanded to cover about 20 million, up to up to 20 million more people. But Medicaid, which is the joint federal program, joint federal and state program that covers lower income Americans, has already in most states been paying doctors so little that it's difficult for them to even even pay their expenses. In some states, a doctor's visit pays seven dollars. I mean, obviously, $7. this is not something that they're going to be able to maintain over a long term. So they basically see Medicaid patients as charity patients, but they have to fill out volumes of paperwork for them too. Am I hearing that right? You said seven dollars. I mean, the, that whole $7 concept. $7 my son, the doctor, office. become a doctor. You, you, you'll live well. Right. Wow. And of course, they can't afford to take very many Medicaid patients, which is why so many Medicaid patients wind up going to hospital emergency rooms for even routine care, because it's so difficult for them to find a doctor, a, pri a doctor in private practice, who can afford to take very many Medicaid patients. So yes, there's, and I'm very worried that that's going to make it even more difficult for people on Medicaid today who have no other options for coverage and care to find a doctor who will see them. Do well, people write letters to me about this and tell me, you know, I've got a daughter who's handicapped and she's on Medicaid. It takes me six weeks, her father wrote to me, to get an appointment with your, her urologist. Do they consider what will happen if we have millions more people competing for appointments with those fewer, few doctors and so if it, it, Grace Marie, if it takes six weeks to, to, to get an appointment, Obviously, the next step is you turn you turn to a, an emergency room. That's where you That's can know. They do. Look at if my what? son's sick, I'm taking him to the emergency room. I need the medical care right now. But let me let's go into the heart of heart of this because this is obviously playing out before Congress. The president is out uh, on the road. He's really trying to sell the message on a lot of things. He's principally talking about the economy. But Obamacare, of course, comes up, and the Affordable Care Act is a big. It's certainly a big thing. And now we're starting to hear, you know, within you know, the halls of Congress, we're, we're, we're hearing the words, let's try to defund, you know, me, uh, excuse me, Obamacare. Do you think that the Republican Party will actually move forward and, uh, and actually try to defund the program? 
I think that they're going to do everything they can to protect the American people from this law. The Obama administration has already delayed or changed or or the Congress has amended 18 provisions of this law, and the administration itself has acknowledged that they don't have a great deal of it up and running, so they're delaying many provisions till 2015. I think Congress has a responsibility to delay and defund and ultimately dismantle this law that is driving physicians out of practice. Back to this journal story. But Grace Marie, is that really possible here? I mean, uh, President Obama People may disagree with him. He is the president of the United States. This law has been passed. Aren't we stuck with it? Is there really anything that can be done here? The, pre- the president has already signed into law repeal of seven different provisions of this law. If they start to see, as they get toward January 1st, that they are headed for the train wreck, that one of the Democratic authors of this law, Senator Max Baucus, said that he was worried about, I think they would welcome an opportunity to gain one more year in order to be able to... to All right, I could could picture that, Grace Murray. I could picture that, that they, they don't feel ready. All right. They're not ready. They've, 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 they've moved the employee mandate to 2015. Maybe the next step, let's move the individual mandate to 2015 or perhaps right. further out. But I cannot, in my wildest dreams, picture the Democratic Party and, in principle, this president walking away from Obamacare. They were pretty hard to get us here. Uh, I White can't House picture House- that happening. The, the administration has to create health healthcare exchanges in 34 states. They thought they would have to create exchanges in zero states because they thought states would do it themselves. And about half of the states are not expanding Medicaid because they see the high cost of this. My sense is they're not going to be ready with those federal exchanges to go to go live on October 1, and they would – I, there are many Democrats in Congress who are advising the administration behind the scenes. We would rather see a delay than see a train wreck. Okay, well, I, I don't want a train wreck. We're going to have to leave it right there. We're out of time. Grace Marie, thank you so much for spending your valuable time. Thank you. Call me anytime. That was, of course, Grace Marie Turner, president of the Gallen uh, Institute. I don't think it's going to be defunded. Uh, I'd be shocked if that would actually happen. They're not going to walk away from this program. They've moved the employer mandate. I don't think they're going to try to get rid of the, uh, the individual mandate at all. Not going to happen. Obamacare is here. We're probably stuck with it. You're listening to The Steve Malsberg Show. I'm David Nelson. The Steve Malsberg Show. I love you, son, so it hurts when you say I hate you. I'm your mother. I'm tired of you disrespecting me when you don't get your way. I work hard to make sure you have everything you need. I should be able to ask you to get out of bed in the morning without a fight. So from now on, things are going to be different. I ordered the Total Transformation Program. We're not going to scream and fight anymore. I'm going to tell you what to do in a different way, and you're going to do it. You're not going to call me ugly names anymore, and if you do, you're going to get consequences that'll keep you from calling me ugly names. We're not going to do things your way anymore, son. We're going to do things the Total Transformation way. Get the Total Transformation free. Just order the program, tell us how it works for you, and you can keep it for free. Call 1-888-577-9520. 1-888-577-9520. Call now. Call 1-888-577-9520. 1-888-577-9520. Do you have a motorized wheelchair or scooter that needs repairs and you don't know where to turn? Then call the experts at Precision Repair Network. They are the specialists in repairing all makes and models of motorized wheelchairs and scooters. You can call 24-7 and they will come to you anywhere in the United States. They'll give you a loaner to use until they return yours in perfect condition. And your repairs may be covered by your Medicare or your private insurance, so there is little or no out-of-pocket cost to you. If your wheelchair or scooter needs repairs, call this special hotline now and learn how you can get door-to-door service on your repairs at little or no cost to you. Precision Repair Network. 
They'll get you moving again. Operators are ready to take your call right now. 800-978-4813. 800-978-4813. 800-978-4813. That's 800-978-4813. Hello and welcome to your Newsmax Now update. I'm John Bachman. Disheartening news on the economic front. A new survey shows that four out of five Americans struggle with unemployment, are near poverty, or must rely on welfare for at least part of their life. According to the Associated Press, which conducted the survey, the struggles are increasingly crossing racial lines. More than 76% of white adults say they've experienced economic insecurity by the time they turn 60. The AP says the reason for the trends are global economy, the bigger gap between the rich and the poor, and the loss of high-paying manufacturing jobs. Meanwhile, it appears that Congress and the White House could face a showdown over the budget, with Republicans calling for more cuts to domestic spending in order to raise the debt ceiling. But this weekend on the Sunday talk shows, Treasury Secretary Jack Lew said that option is not on the table. Congress needs to get its work done. It needs to fund the kinds of things the American middle class need. And we need to get the debt limit extended in a way that doesn't create a crisis. That is what every Congress needs to do. And Congress needs to do it when it gets back in September. Israel and the Palestinians have agreed to restart preliminary peace talks. The State Department says the meetings will begin later today in Washington, D.C., the last two days, and will focus on developing a roadmap for future negotiations. Both sides agreed to sit down after Israeli leaders said they would release more than 100 Palestinian prisoners. And Pope Francis has just arrived back in Italy after his week-long trip to Brazil, and once again he set a new standard by holding a news conference aboard the flight home. He says he's very happy with his Brazil trip, and why not huge crowds turned out throughout his historic visit. An ocean of Catholics occupied Copacabana Beach Sunday when the Pope held an open-air mass for three million people in Rio de Janeiro. It was one of his last stops on his seven-day homecoming to Latin America after being elected Pope. And his Sunday message clearly inspired the massive crowd, including those who came from far away. The Pope says diminished security allowed him to get close to the people. He says he sometimes feels caged in in the Vatican and would someday like to walk the streets of Rome. And police in France are on the hunt for stolen jewels. $53 million worth of jewelry was taken in Cannes yesterday in a brazen daytime heist at the famous Carlton Hotel. Witnesses say a lone armed robber snatched the precious stones, put them in a briefcase, and then he vanished into the crowd. Detectives say this has all the markings of a professional job. It is the third high-profile jewelry heist in the French Riviera just this year. And next up on your Newsmax Now update, NBC plans a new miniseries based on the life of Hillary Clinton. See which Hollywood leading lady has been tapped to play the former first lady. Plus a Newsmax exclusive with Utah Senator Orrin Hatch. Hear his take on the House's immigration plan next. You've heard the allegations on the news, and during the big game, pro football players have been using deer antler velvet to get a competitive edge. Banned at the London Games for its performance-enhancing qualities. Forbidden in major sports leagues for being an unfair advantage to athletes. Deer antler velvet is now in stock and available to try for free for a limited time only. Athletes have been using it for years for increased strength, increased endurance, muscle mass stress reduction, and yes, greatly enhanced libido. Everyone's talking about this miracle substance so powerful, it's being banned by professionals professional sports organizations, but for a limited time, it's being made available to the general public. Best of all, you can try it for free by calling 800-678-5153. That's right. Get Superior Velvet for free. If you're looking to boost your performance on the field and between the sheets, get the most powerful proven product used by athletes for years now for free. Claim your free bottle today by calling 800-678-5153. That's 800-678-5153. Again, 800-678-5153. In 2013, half of your friends, family, and neighbors may lose their jobs, all while you are robbed of 90% of your life savings, investments, and home's value. Controversial economist Robert Wiedemer, who was the only expert to predict the recession, has released a startling video with shocking evidence that the powers that be have tried to ban. But that hasn't stopped 50 million people from getting the truth. Watch it at AfterShockVideo.com. AfterShockVideo.com. Obamacare, more than a trillion in new costs, hidden taxes, fees, big Medicare cuts, doctor shortages. How can we survive? To know Obamacare is to survive Obamacare. 
The Obamacare Survival Guide tells you everything you need to know to protect yourself, your family, your business. The Obamacare Survival Guide at bookstores everywhere. Special internet only offer right now at Obamacare911.com. And welcome back. NBC will air a new miniseries focused on the life of Hillary Clinton ahead of a potential presidential run in 2016. The project is set to take place starting back in 1998 towards the end of President Bill Clinton's second term. NBC's president says the miniseries is designed to, quote, shake things up as broadcast audiences have fallen by as much as 7 percent a year. It will star Diane Lane as the former first lady and secretary of state. And it looks like the House will finally take up the immigration reform debate in October. Meanwhile, we talked to Utah Senator Orrin Hatch about the Senate's bill. Hatch says he and his colleagues did a pretty good job, but it's vital the House also pass a plan that appeals to both parties and both chambers. We've got de facto amnesty on 11 million people who don't know what their status is other than they're illegal. And to see more of our exclusive interviews and content, stay with Newsmax.com. This has been your Newsmax Now update for July 29th. I'm John Bachman. Now here's the Steve Malzberg Show in New York. Are you ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live from the Newsmax studios, this is the Steve Malzberg Show. Be a part of the action by calling 855-777-9660. That's 855-777-9660. Or email Steve at malzbergshow at newsmax.com. Here is Steve Malzberg. Welcome back. I'm David Nelson. This is, of course, the Steve Malzberg Show. Have you ever wanted to find sunken treasure? I remember when I was a kid, the concept of sunken treasure, uh, pirates, gold, silver, transporting it, transporting it across the ocean. Think of how much is down there. All the ships that have sunk that for centuries, imagine how much gold and silver is down there. So how'd you like to find it? Well, we're going to talk to somebody who does just that. We're going to talk to Mike, Mark Gordon. He's the chief operating officer of Odyssey Marine, they just found, I believe, he's going to tell us, they found 61 million tons of silver. Mark, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, great to be with you, David. Thanks for being with us, Mark. You know, I read this story, uh, you know, it was in the Tampa Bay Times, that uh, Odyssey Marine, you, you found 61 million uh, tons of silver. Is that, do I have that figure correct? Oh, I wish you were right. It's 61 tons. 61, 61 tons. I'm sorry. That's a good 61 tons. <laughs> I, I'm, I, was thinking, I was thinking dollars, and I realized, well, 61 yeah. tons of silver is a lot more That's than $61 right. million. Dollars. It's about 1.8 million ounces of silver. What does that translate into, into real dollars and cents? Oh, well, with today's silver price is about $35 million. $35 million. Now, yeah. this isn't the first time uh, that you've done this. No. In fact, uh, this shipwreck that we got the silver from, the SS Gersapa, we actually started the project last year and picked up 48 tons of silver last year. Now, silver prices were better last year, so that was worth, um, I'm sorry, it was about 48 tons, and it was about $41 million with silver prices where they were this time last year. So about almost 110 tons altogether and about $76 million of combined value in the past. All right, that, that, it's a lot of money, of course, but this, this stuff is, I, I got to believe, is, is hard to get to. I mean, what kind of money do you have to spend to actually do it, and how dangerous is it? Well, yeah, it's a good question. The, the, it's, it's quite uh, an intricate and expensive operation. Uh, it costs almost $130,000 a day uh, wow. for the operation out there. Uh, so all told, we'll have probably about $20 million in expenses against the $76 million. Uh, it, and while it's, it can be a very dangerous environment, we have a top team of professionals and we have an impeccable safety uh, rating. We actually use unmanned robotic submarines, uh, so no one's in the water. So nobody's uh, actually in the water diving down like right. in the old movies that we saw. Yeah, no, not, not, not anymore. I tell It's funny because I worked my way through college as a diver. And uh, I tell people now, if someone's gotten wet in our operation, we've had an accident. Uh, <laughs> it's all done with unmanned vehicles. We're working at such extreme depth, it's the only way to do it. This silver was recovered from about 15,400 feet underwater, which oh is gosh. deeper than the Titanic. It's about three miles underwater working at that depth. So it's really the only way to so, do that. So how do you even know where to look? I mean, I would imagine there's a tremendous amount of investigative work Do you have Detectives that go out and examine documents. Uh, we're talking about stuff that's, you know, sunk a long time ago. 
That's right, yes. And uh, it does start with detective work. In our case, we have historians. We have a great team of historians and researchers uh, that are looking at uh, publicly available historic documents and trying to discern where there might be a shipwreck. Uh, we then combine that historic research with modern computer modeling, uh, much like the search and rescue uh, modeling that's used by the Coast Guard and the military to try to determine where the wreck may be. And then we have the best marine operations team in the world with a very sophisticated suite of search tools that go out in the area the research teams uh, direct us to go. And they scan the seafloor looking for anomalies. And uh, uh, I'm kind of oversimplifying it, but that, that's essentially what happens. i got to believe it, it, it's really difficult. You know, we've been talking about silver, but what about gold? Uh, have, you, have you found a lot of gold, or is there just less of it down there? Oh, yeah, no, no. There's plenty of gold out there as well. Um, we actually did a wreck a few years back, a Civil War era wreck that was a mix of gold and silver coins and uh, uh, lots of gold. You know, you, as you kind of said in your lead in, uh, ships have been transporting valuables for, you know, thousands of years. And until the mid 20th century, the only way to transport wealth was on the water. And, you know, that sets up a formula where there's billions of dollars of interesting and valuable things literally scattered all over the seafloor. What about, uh, you know, what, what about, you know, things like, uh, you know, jewelry, diamonds? Has that ever transported? Is always like, you know, precious metals? Oh, yeah, no, sure. You can find all of that. In fact, one of the very first uh, shipwreck projects our founders were engaged in, they found a wreck uh, from the early 1600s, and there were jewelry pieces on there. There were uh, gemstones. There were gold bars, uh, coinage. So, yeah, no, it's an array, um, you know, of interesting things that you see in these different shipwrecks. They're like little time capsules of whatever was going on at that point in time that they sailed and sunk. Mark, I, I got to believe it's a really exciting moment when you when you bring, I guess, whatever it is you bring up and you go through it. And you, you, you see that you got the goods. But I also have to believe, you know, with success, there's also sometimes failure. Can you talk, talk about maybe an incident where you thought you really had the goods and you really thought you were going to you know, st strike it rich, so to speak, and you got down there and there was just nothing there? Uh, yeah, you know, it. it um uh, it rarely happens that we come up with a zero on the project, but uh, we did have an incident um, a couple of years ago where we made a recovery, uh, and uh, that recovery was subsequently taken away uh, from us. Uh, taken away? Yeah. In, in what sense? Robbed? No, 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 no. Well, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, no, we, we went through uh, a process, uh, a legal process with the courts, but... Uh, um, oh, so you uh, found, you explain this now, you, you, found, you found the silver, was it silver or gold? Uh, actually, it was, a, it was a bunch of silver coins, and uh, we, we recovered it, you know, in accordance with all uh, of the laws we knew it at that point in time, but it got very political, and, uh, um, and the net of it is the, the U.S. government decided to help. The U.S. government, government well, I can understand, <laughs> I can understand that. I, I, I read something in the paper about Spain. Am I wrong on that? Was, was there an no, altercation? that's right. That, that's exactly the incident where... Uh, well, how does Spain fit in, and why does the U.S. end up with the money? Uh, actually, no, Spain ended up with it. Spain uh, ended up with it. Yeah, okay. what, what ended up happening was um, there, there was an admiralty uh, court case, but uh, the, the case was never actually heard by the courts. They dismissed it, um, but, but we were ordered to turn the silver over to Spain. And you got to keep nothing. Got to keep nothing, that's correct. Not even expenses? Uh, nope. Uh, that, that was a zero. That's amazing. But, uh, but getting back to your original question, you know, the... Uh, you know, when we're out actually looking and we're targeting these wrecks, we have right now uh, pretty much a 100% track record of finding uh, what we looked for and uh, having them be valuable recoveries. So this is, you know, actually our, our third or fourth. All right, this is the big question that probably everybody would like an answer to. You, you found, mm -hmm. obviously, millions of dollars worth of gold and silver. I can't even imagine how much gold and silver you, you might project, but if... Have you run the numbers? What are we talking about? Has anybody made a projection about how much gold and silver is actually sitting at the bottom of the ocean? Yeah, well, it's hard to put a number on that, but I can tell you the United Nations has estimated there's 3 million shipwrecks in the ocean, and that might sound like a staggering number, uh, but we have found wrecks that actually predate Christ, so we know ships have been sinking for a few thousand years, 
And when you think, you know, an average of 1,500 to 1,000 to 1,500 wrecks a year, uh, you pretty quickly get to that number. Now, coming back to what I mentioned earlier, until the mid-20th century, the only way to transport cargo or valuables was on the water. And um, so, again, it's a formula where I think you could safely guess that there's billions of dollars. I know that uh, we have over 100 wrecks in our proprietary database that are worth at minimum $50 million. $50 million, okay. And some of them at the high end are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, could even be over, you know, a billion dollars in individual value. So anyway, safe to say there's... Are you working on anything there. real exciting? I know you can't tell us where you are. I mean, <laughs> how, how do you, that, that brings up a good point here. How do you keep it secret? I mean, people see your ship in a certain spot. How do you keep everybody else from, you know, horning in on your, on your find? Yeah, well, the the, uh, the the major advantage we have is that we're normally working in such deep water and so far offshore that there there really are very few people in the world that even have the equipment to okay. do what we do. So even if you knew, like for instance, this where the Gersapa that we got all the silver off of last week, uh, that's uh, as a 300 miles off Ireland and 15,000 feet down. So even if you knew exactly where we were, <laughs> there's not a lot you could do. And then. Uh, the, the other challenge on that one, by the way, just to add degrees of difficulty, was we had to surgically open a steel ship, you know, deconstruct it to get into the areas where the silver was. So basically the remote location and depth that we're working provides the protection. Okay, so a couple of teenagers in, with scuba outfits aren't, aren't going to be able to, uh, yeah, to get to this no, stuff. Not a it's a fascinating threat, story, uh, uh, Mark. It's just a fascinating story. Thank you so much for spending your time. We've got to have you back again real soon. I'd love to do that. That was, of course, Mark Gordon, uh, the Chief Operating Officer of Odyssey Marine. Pretty fascinating stuff, uh, finding uh, gold and silver at the bottom of the, uh, bottom of the ocean. Uh, I'd love to be a part of it. We've got a great show for the rest of the show. You're listening to The Steve Malzberg Show. I'm David Nelson. We'll be right back. The Steve Malzberg Show. Hi, this is Dick Morris. Obamacare is taking full effect this year with over 15,000 pages of regulations. You need to know how this law affects you. That's why you should get your copy of Obamacare's Survival Guide. It's easy to read and the best guide to the new law. Even if you're currently insured or a senior on Medicare or a business owner, a medical profession, or really any citizen, you need the Obamacare Survival Guide. In it, you'll find about hidden taxes, fees, and fines, including a 40% tax on some health plans. I warned you about Obamacare. It's rationing Medicare cuts and will trigger doctor shortages. Now the Obamacare Survival Guide gives you the simple steps to protect your family. So get the Obamacare Survival Guide at bookstores everywhere. It's already a number one Amazon bestseller. Or get our special $4.95 offer and save $15 today by going to Obamacare911.com. Obamacare911.com. That's Obamacare911.com. Hello, my name is Fred Flights, and I'm the managing editor of Lignet. You've probably seen our name preceding some of the stories you've read on Newsmax or heard Lignet referenced on Fox News, C-SPAN, or CNN. Perhaps you've asked yourself, what is Lignet? Lignet is an acronym for the Langley Intelligence Group Network, a private Washington, D.C.-based service that provides global intelligence, in-depth analysis, and detailed forecasting. Lignet's staff and advisors include former CIA officers, national security experts, presidential advisors, and top-level government officials from around the world. I myself held several national security posts for the U.S. government during my 25-year career with the Central Intelligence Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the U.S. Department of State, and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Our lead advisor is General Michael Hayden, the former director of the CIA. He is joined by former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations John Bolton and former Chairman of the National Intelligence Council and Special Assistant to President Ronald Reagan for its airmark. Former U.S. Ambassador to Venezuela Otto Reich and former Clandestine Service Officer Frederick Russman, former Chairman of the House Intelligence Committee Peter Hoekstra also join our advisory board staff. Every day our goal is to use our expertise, our resources, and our worldwide staff to take the pulse of the ever-changing political and economic landscape and the threats we face on a daily basis. Whether you are following global events for your portfolio or business, or just interested in the world around you, Lignet provides what you need to know to keep up with global events. 
There are many. Every day, LigNet members receive The Morning Brief, a daily email that provides summaries and links to our daily analysis to keep you up to date on LigNet's assessments. LigNet members receive unrestricted access to LigNet's secure database of global analysis. All of our special reports, previous analyses, and exclusive video interviews with intelligence insiders are available to members 24 hours a day. But you also get top-notch analysis that resembles the President's Daily Brief, the classified intelligence assessment delivered to the President of the United States every morning. LigNet also sends breaking news emails to our membership list. If there is a development of global proportions or a terror alert, our subscribers are always the first to know. I hope you now have a better understanding of what LigNet is, but more importantly, recognize how truly invaluable LigNet can be. As the old saying goes, knowledge is power. Join LigNet for $1. Go to lignet.com. Breaking news and breaking hearts. Aww. This is the Steve Malzberg Show. Welcome back. I'm David Nelson. This is the Steve Malzberg Show. I'm filling in uh, for today with Steve. Uh, we got a great show lined up for you, and especially this hour, because my next guest is going to be Victoria Jackson. We all remember she's the famous, uh, wonderful comedian from Saturday Night Live from the mid-1980s. We're going to talk about her and her recent antics, and we're going to talk about the fact that she's gone from Hollywood all the way to the Tea Party, and uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. But before I, I bring on Victoria, I, I want to share a few things that I, I just happened to see over the last few days. One in particular really got me, right? Hasbro, the founders and the owners of uh, Monopoly, a game I've been playing since I was eight years old, are getting rid of the get out of jail free card. Now, why are they doing that? Because they're getting rid of the jail. They're actually getting rid of the jail in Monopoly. They want to speed up the game. <sighs> I got to tell you, it really hit me hard because this is going to screw up my whole winning technique. I want you to take a look at this. Let's go to cut 10. Kids these days are just way too busy, so busy, in fact, that Hasbro is finding a new way to keep their attention, like making a whole new version of Monopoly, the board game, but without a jail. That's right, jail-free Hasbro has removed the go-to-jail space to speed up the pace of play. You know, it's, it's just not right. Of course, uh, that was Bloomberg talking about, uh, about Monopoly, and it isn't right. They're, they're absolutely right. They're getting rid of, the, of jail. They want to speed up the game, but my way of winning is now destroyed because when I played Monopoly, it was uh, maybe a 14, 15 hour game sometimes. And the way I won these games was very simple. I just stuck in there. I never gave up. And eventually my mom, my dad, my sisters, my brother, they would throw in the towel. They, they couldn't do that. But by doing this, they're actually destroying the game. And it even takes away from the fun of it because I remember when I was a kid, part of my technique was, was what I chose. And in a fast game like it's going to be like now, this technique would go out the window. But one of the things you do with Monopoly, you don't go for boardwalk and park, park place. You avoid the high rent district. That's not going to win you the game. You also avoid the low rent district. Uh, and I believe that's a Baltic Avenue. The real money in, uh, in Monopoly is made on that far corner up around, I think it's around free parking is up there. And that's where the money is made. You want to be uh, New York Avenue, uh, not St. James Place, New York Avenue, uh, Marvin Gardens, and you can all the way, go all the way to the green uh, to Pennsylvania Avenue, and uh, that's where I would put your money. But they've destroyed the game. I was a little disappointed at this. Uh, uh, I'm still playing with my old board game. I still have it in the closet. Uh, we'll do that. The other news that, of course, uh, hit over the weekend is the, the Wiener story uh, uh, keeps unfolding. And... All you have to see, and I wish I had a, a picture of this for you, I wish you could see it, is the cover of the New Yorker, all right? The cover of the New Yorker is a picture, imagine this, a picture of Anthony Weiner straddled across the Empire State Building in a very graphic, uh, graphic figure. Uh, 
you can just imagine what, what, what a, a picture's worth a thousand words and, that, words, and that's what Dick Gregory uh, actually said. Uh, let's go to clip 10. Let's, here's, a, here's a, I believe, uh, Anthony Weiner uh, speaking to the press. It's not dozens and dozens. It is, it is six to ten, I suppose, but I, I can't tell you absolutely what someone else is going to consider inappropriate or not. That was, of course, uh, Anthony. But then his wife comes on a couple of minutes later, and she's in defense of this. Let's, let's listen to her. And I believe that is a uh, clip. Let's go to clip seven. Anthony's made some horrible mistakes, both before he resigned from Congress and after. But I do very strongly believe that that is between us and our, our marriage. All right. This has been unfolding, but now the newest news that, that's come out on this is, in fact, that uh, Wiener's campaign chief has quit, all right? And he's going to somehow uh, continue on in this passage. I think Anthony Wiener is really a victim more of technology than anything else. Hillary and Clinton, excuse me, Hillary and her husband, uh, Bill Clinton, are up in arms over all this. Uh, they are appalled that, uh, that they are being... Uh, compared to that this uh, scandal is something like theirs. I think, you know, he's just a victim of technology. He didn't have sex with anybody. All he did was, you know, tweet something. Didn't this guy ever hear Snapchat or, or something like that? I'm going to ask the crew to see if they can find a clip. There's a clip somewhere in here with the comedians talking about, uh, about, about all this, but we'll see if we can find that. But I, I think you got to, you know, uh, I, I think you got to give the guy a break. And I think what, what's also happening here is this is really good news for Christine Quinn. She was on uh, Meet the Press uh, just the other day, and she was talking about it. She avoided the question. She avoided uh, talking about or even saying that uh, Anthony Weiner should drop out of the race. Why? Why does she want to drop out of the race? Not drop out of the race? Because it helps her campaign. I think she's polling at uh, 25. He was at 25. He's now at 16. If, if, he goes, if he goes out of the race, then what would that mean for her? Those votes might go to her opponents and, and might not help her, so she's not like that. Here's what I think. Uh, I don't think he necessarily has to drop out of the race. I think New York City uh, voters have to make a choice here. And have to ask yourself the, the question, do you really want to deal with this scandal? Uh, is it doing you a service? If, if it's not, just turn it off. Just turn it off. Vote, vote your conscience. Vote for who you want to uh, vote for. Uh, the fact that he's running, who are we to say that he shouldn't run? He's going to run. If he wants to run, let him run. Uh, I don't think we can force him out of the race. It's kind of, you know, ridiculous at this point. He's making a, I'll say the word, he's making an ass out of himself. And uh, I question the motives of his, uh, of his wife. I'm not sure why she's uh, defending him like this. There's been some uh, talk about the salary that she's getting uh, you know, for not even doing her job right now. I don't even want to go there, but uh, I don't like it. You're listening to The Steve Walsberg Show. I'm David Nelson. We'll be back in a few minutes. The Steve Malsberg Show. Obamacare. President Obama's massive health care law is taking effect this year. With over 15,000 pages of regulations, few even know what it means. Now, the Obamacare Survival Guide by Nick Tate gives you the shocking facts about this law. It's a step-by-step -step guide on how you can protect yourself. Already the New York Times bestseller, every American needs to get the Obamacare Survival Guide and find out about the new taxes, hidden fees, fines, Medicare changes, business rules, and why doctor shortages are likely. Donald Trump says the Obamacare Survival Guide is a must-read for anyone worried about getting good health care for themselves or their employees. So get the Obamacare Survival Guide. It's at bookstores or get our special offer at Obamacare911.com and you'll save $15. Go now to Obamacare911.com. Obamacare911.com. Health insurance is on everybody's mind right now. You either don't have it or you have it and you think it's too expensive. And you probably feel like you don't have any options. We can help. We are InSphere Insurance Solutions. We offer health insurance plans from major carriers nationwide and likely have a plan that can save you money. 
Whether you're self-employed, on a COBRA plan that's about to expire, or you simply don't have health insurance where you work and you need it, InSphere Insurance Solutions can help you. Our agents will help you find coverage you can afford. InSphere Insurance Solutions is an authorized agency in all 50 states, including the District of Columbia. Plans may not be available in all states. 800-980-9325. Meet Jim. Like many of us, Jim enjoys a busy life. Between work, family, and friends, his days zip along, and Jim has the energy to tackle almost anything. But lately, Jim's get up and go has literally taken on a new meaning. Jim's always put focus on a full night's sleep, but it seems like these days, he's up and down to go to the bathroom so many times he can barely wake up in the morning. His prostate concerns have him sad, tired, and worried. Activities that were once enjoyable now seem like a chore for Jim. His golf game is at the mercy of his bathroom schedule. Family outings are planned around it too. Jim even has difficulty going to the bathroom. He's tried so many prostate remedies he can't keep them straight. And nothing ever seems to help. Then Jim found out about Prostate Revive, the all-natural dietary supplement specifically formulated for men, targeted towards improving and sustaining normal prostate function. Prostate Revive includes 15 super ingredients never combined before including saw palmetto extract, beta cytosterol, pomegranate fruit extract, selenium, and other high quality nutrients. These targeted and all natural ingredients promote healthy urinary flow and optimal prostate health. And the best part is, Prostate Revive was developed by a renowned medical doctor. Dr. David Brownstein personally formulated Prostate Revive with one goal in mind, to promote a healthy prostate gland. Thanks to Prostate Revive, Jim's got his life back. He gets a full night's sleep every night, and his friends and his wife can't believe he's the same guy. He has his old energy back, and no one has to wait for him. He doesn't even think about his prostate concerns anymore. Visit MedicSelect.com to take back your nights and improve your quality of life with Prostate Revive. Can you find the Steve Malzberg Show? Everywhere. From your smartphone to satellite radio. To Newsmax Live TV. To Roku. We have you covered. Here is Steve Malzberg. Welcome back, everyone. I'm David Nelson. This is the Steve Malzberg Show. Victoria Jackson. She's the brilliant comedian from Saturday Night Live in the 1980s, the mid-1980s. It was a fabulous show. She uh, was on stage with the likes of Dennis Miller, uh, Eddie Murphy and others. Uh, it was just a fabulous time for comedy. Well, she's out there again. She's out there again. You'll all remember her. She played those dumb, ditzy roles out there on Saturday Night Live. We'll find out uh, if she was really as ditzy as she says. I don't think she was. Uh, periodically, she pops her head up. And recently, she made a uh, surprise appearance on Bill O'Reilly's show. I believe it was last week. Let's just roll the tape. Let's look at Cut 19. At that time, you're not a conservative person, are you? No, I was a Christian. I'm a mother first, and I'm a Christian second, and I'm a wife slash lover third, and I'm a um, housekeeper fourth, and fifth, I'm a news reporter, Dennis, fifth in my priority. Wow. America, America. That was, of course, uh, that was Victoria Jackson on, on Bill O'Reilly's show. And that, that shot that you saw was her on Saturday Night Live. She's gone all the way from Hollywood to the Tea Party. Let's bring her on. Victoria Jackson joins us by phone. Victoria, thanks so much for calling in today. This is great to have you. Hi, David. Thank you for having me. I so, have to tell you, on that clip they played from Saturday Night Live, Yeah. I, I should have said in my list of priorities that I was, number one, I was a Christian, because the Bible says you should put Christ before your family. But the reason I said mother first was because the whole shtick I was doing 
was about uh, my daughter who was a baby, and I was showing films of her on the update desk, and I thought the joke was better if I said number one mother. But Christian-wise speaking, theologically speaking, I should have said number one Christian, number two mother. <laughs> well, I want to talk to you about that, Victoria, because, but I, the question I have to ask, and a lot of viewers would like to know the answer to this, how did you go from Hollywood which definitely has liberal leanings. This is definitely the left element out there. How do you go from Hollywood all the way to the Tea Party? Walk us through your thought process. Well, it's not that big of a jump if you're a Christian. You already okay. are a conservative, basically. I just wasn't political because no one in my family or my friends or anywhere ever talked about politics. And when I was 18, I said to my dad, who should I vote for? And he said, anyone with an R next to their name. And I said, why? Are they Christians? And he goes, no, but they're closer to the Bible than the D's. And that was my whole political education, where Al Franken, when I worked with him, he told me that every night around his family dinner table in his childhood, they would discuss politics. Every night around my family dinner table, we would discuss the Bible and, Christ and uh, gymnastics. So I grew up an expert on the Bible and gymnastics. <laughs> Bible and gym. I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to put those two together. The Bible and gymnastics. You got to walk me through that. I don't get it. Well, I think the only correlation is that my father, who was a gymnastics coach and a Baptist deacon, wanted to raise children who were perfect physically, mentally, and spiritually, and that is hard, and that's a big burden to carry as a child. <laughs> All right, Victoria, I, I, I have to ask you this question because you're on record saying this. You're on record saying they are out to kill Christians. Are you really afraid for your life? Okay, this is an issue I'm glad you brought up. I am very grateful that Bill O'Reilly and Fox News let me be on TV and express my opinion and sell my book. However, they edited my interview, and if you watch the tape, it's easy to see where they edited it. When I watched it, when I came home, I was like, wait a minute. They left out some of my sentences, and what they, they edited it to make it sound like I was saying, I'm afraid the communists in America are going to kill me any day now. That's not what I said. This is in my exact quote. I said, the reason I'm passionate about this is because I'm going to die soon, but my children are going to be here, and I don't want them to grow up in a communist country because they persecute and kill Christians, and I taught them to believe in Jesus Christ. That was my sentence. They took out the part alluding to my children, and it kind of sounded like I said, I'm going to die soon, communists kill Christians. Now, I shouldn't make a fuss about it because... It is true. Communists do kill Christians. It's just that I wasn't like a dingbat flapping my arms in a paranoid, you know, state. Uh, I, I'm just telling the facts the way they are. Well, they, I grew up in Miami, and Cubans were escaping communism from Cuba, telling me that the first thing to go was the nuns and the priests, because you cannot worship God in the state, and communism makes you worship the state. And they always get rid of the Christians first. All right, you, you're mentioning communism, so I got to take you to Washington because one of the statements you also made is that President Obama is a communist. That's a very big statement, Victoria. That's going to raise oh a lot of goodness. eyebrows. It's, it's so obvious. But here's the thing they don't call it that anymore, they call it collectivist or progressive. And it's so cute because the new word is collectivist, and I see it popping up here and there. And it's the same meaning. It means the government controlling everything. If you, if you studied Obama's past, oh, the other sentence they left out of O'Reilly was when I quoted Aaron Klein, Dinesh D'Souza, and Trevor Loudon as books that prove my point. They left that out, so it just sounds like I'm a dip. <laughs> but the point is, Obama's, uh, all these books prove that his childhood mentor, Frank Marshall Davis, was a card-carrying member of the Communist Party. Paul Kengor is a professor who wrote a book called The Communist and even has the number of Obama's grandparents' Communist Party card. Valerie Jarrett, who is Obama's right-hand woman man, <laughs> she, her grandfather was a card-carrying member of the Communist Party. Paul Kengor can prove that. His, his white grandparents who raised him were communists. His mother was a communist. His father from Kenya. All right, was a I think I, I get it. it. It's too confusing for, for, for me. But let, let me take it to the world of social issues because you comment on this now and then. And I'm going to go back to 2011. In 2011, 
You wrote in your blog the following, and let me just read this for our viewers. Did you see Glee this week? Sickening. And besides shoving the gay thing down our throats, they made a mockery of Christians again. They were talking about a, a gay kiss between the two men on, on the show. Given what's happened in this country, I mean, you know, the Supreme Court is starting to lean that way. What are your views here? Are, are you upset about this? I'm very upset about it. The Bible, God is very much against homosexuality, and uh, if the culture tries to make it the norm, I don't care. I, uh, God is my God, not Obama, not the culture, not the show Glee. By the way, that guy just committed suicide. Uh, the young actor from Glee, you know? Right. I'm not uh, sure it was I'm, the same, same actor, but I believe it was, it was an overdose, I believe, yes. Well, this, my, my point, well, first of all, homosexuality, it's a free country. You can do whatever you want. But the problem with it, now that it's politicized... If you can do whatever you want, uh, Victoria, if, you know, people, critics would point out, if you can do whatever you want, why can't they show it on TV? Because six-year-olds and eight-year-olds and 12-year-olds with an empty slate mind, with an innocent mind, are sitting in the living room, and you are teaching them, you are showing them that it's a normal lifestyle and behavior. It is not a normal lifestyle and behavior. And um, it, is, it is completely against God. And our, our children, are, well, children are innocent. Puberty kids are confused enough as it is. Do you think they need more choices, more confusion? Uh, it, it's horrible. I'm so happy my kids are already grown. I would never let my kids watch the show Glee. I, I was see, I was flipping channels, and I stumbled on Glee. And I went, I love this show. I love singing and dancing. I know the lyrics to every musical, and I was loving it. And then they start having this th these two guys kissing and this romantic music. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> well, then let me ask you that, Victoria. You, you mentioned your kids. W would you have let your kids watch Saturday Night Live? Do you let them watch it now? Uh, first of all, there was no men kissing on Saturday Night Live in 1988. Maybe now. Uh, in ten, I'll tell you what, in 10 years, it was the goal, the, the, the socialist, a Marxist goal, to break up the family unit. And they have been uh, trying to do that for, for the last 20 years. Uh, my friend, David Capellian, wrote a book called The Marketing of Evil, and he can prove that... Um, these two gay guys, the super smart uh, marketing guys, one from Harvard, actually wrote a book on how to change the American culture to accept homosexuality as normal. And they accomplished it in 10 years. And you've got to read his book. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, 10 years ago, it would have been shocking for people. Victoria, let me ask you before you go. Uh, you, you work with some of the greats in comedy. You're, you're from a, a legendary era. Uh, do you keep in touch with any of, uh, of your uh, acting, uh, I guess, uh, stage mates? Well, I see them occasionally. Me and John Lovitz are doing stand-up together next year, actually. It's already been booked. Um, I saw once in a while we do stand-up together, but I haven't seen them recently. Well, one of them lives in, let's see, Northern California. I'm in... Well, I'm not telling where I'm in. Cause where are I? I, have... <laughs> I, I forgot. They're trying to kill the Christians. They can't. You got to keep it secret. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about what about the new, the new iteration of the Saturday Night Live? It's been on forever. All right, it's gone through a lot of transformations. What do you think of the show? The lineup that they have right now. Actually, I just called John Lovitz yesterday. I'm waiting for him to call me back. Uh, what do I think of it now? Um, I I haven't seen it recently. I think it's I think we had better writers, and um, I think Kristen Wiig is a genius. But she's she's not on there now, but she was in the last cast. They they, I think some of them are really talented. Do you think that comedians uh, today have the same kind of freedoms that you enjoyed back way back then? What do you mean, freedom? Well, in other words, you, you, you were able to take on almost any subject back then. I'm just wondering, in the, in the, the realm of, you know, corporate uh, networks, you know, they've got to, you know, get out a certain message. Do you think there are any restrictions on the Saturday Night Live cast and the writers today? Yes, yes you do. there is, like, 
as freedom. Number one, political correctness is censorship, and censorship is the death of freedom of speech. And nowadays on, on SNL or TV, you cannot criticize Islam. And that scares me because Sharia law says you cannot criticize Islam. The Constitution says you can criticize anything. So are we now under Sharia law? And when did that happen? So number one, they do not criticize Islam on SNL. They do criticize Christians. And number two, they never criticize, they never make fun of Obama except maybe once every 48 shows for like one joke. But, I mean, they are really afraid of making fun of the dictator. Well, it, it is Hollywood, uh, Victoria. Victoria, congratulations on the book. Hope you can come back again real soon. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. That was, of course, Victoria Jackson, uh, famous comedian from the Saturday Night Live. Fantastic story. She's a fun, fun person. We've got a great hour for... For the rest of the hour coming up, I'm going to talk about a few things. And uh, coming up later in the program, we're going to have uh, Bethany McLean, who's going to talk about SAC Capital, what's going on there. It looks like the Justice Department is uh, really going after the firm. They want to get Stevie Cohen. We're going to hear what uh, Bethany has to say about that. You're listening to The Steve Malsberg Show. I'm David Nelson. We'll be right back. The Steve Malsberg Show. Heart disease is the biggest killer disease in America, and this doesn't surprise me. We are addicted to starches, sugars, fatty meats, and salt. People who live in countries with little heart disease eat very differently. One way some people stay heart healthy is by following what is known as the caveman or Stonehenge diet, so named because of its similarity to the way our prehistoric ancestors ate. People who follow this type of diet live off local fruits and root vegetables and get their protein mostly from fish and wild game they shoot themselves. Now since most of us don't hunt or fish for all our protein, here are some simple tips on how you can start to eat like a caveman modern day style. First, fill up on fruits and vegetables. Eat them first and you'll be less hungry. Feast on fish which is rich in nutrients, but not in calories. Choose fatty fish like mackerel, herring, sardines, and salmon, which are rich in heart-healthy omega-3 fatty acids. Get out and go for a walk. Remember, our ancestors were hunters and gatherers, so they didn't spend their time sitting in front of a TV or computer all day. If you live more like a caveman or a cave woman, your heart will love you for it. I'm Dr. Chauncey Crandall, and thank you for watching this Heart Health Minute. Remember, it's never too late to prevent or reverse heart disease. Right now, I invite you to discover your own risk for heart disease or even a heart attack by taking my quick, free online quiz at www.simpleheartest.com. Tired of calls, levies, and liens from the IRS or hiring others who don't get the job done? Call Wall & Associates and you'll never talk to the IRS again. The IRS has a program to eliminate tax debt and Wall & Associates professionals are trained to maximize its benefits for you. You always speak with a live person with real support and real knowledge. We've helped thousands of taxpayers like you settle their tax debt with the IRS for a fraction of what they owe. We solve tax problems. Call Wall & Associates now. 800-574-6029. We have the professionals who know how to solve tax problems. If you owe money to the IRS, your tax problems are not going away by themselves, and the passage of time will only make matters worse. Act now before it's too late. Call Wall & Associates right now to speak to a professional tax relief agent. Call 800-574-6029. That's 800-574-6029. Again, 800-574-6029. We're in the midst of an obesity epidemic, and I'm not surprised. The statistics on obesity mirror an increasing trend of eating out or ordering in. In fact, some people dine out every night, but eating in restaurants is one of the biggest enemies of your heart. When you're in a restaurant, you don't really know 
what you're getting. And the calorie counts of many restaurant dishes are astronomical. In fact, some single dishes contain more calories than we should eat in an entire day. Eating in fast food restaurants is even worse. A diet of hamburgers, french fries, and shakes constitutes a fast lane to the emergency room. If you really want to help your heart, get in the habit of cooking simple meals at home. Here are three easy tips that will make your food taste better than even the best restaurant. Choose the best fruit in season. Your local farmer's market is a great place to start. It will probably still cost less than that pie you were thinking of buying. Get in the habit of using fresh herbs. You can use them in egg white omelets or dust them on the fish you grill or bake. And for a light dessert, choose a square or two of dark chocolate that, that you and your spouse can enjoy. There are lots of ways to make your heart healthy, but there are also lots of ways to damage it. That's why I wrote Fix It, Dr. Crandall's 90-day program. In it, I'll tell you how to kickstart your metabolism every day, how to pick the best diet for you, how to stop hunger from sabotaging your diet, the seven superfoods for your heart. I'm Dr. Chauncey Crandall, and thanks for watching this Heart Health Minute. The Steve Mossberg Show is just a bit different from the other radio shows. We have TV cameras. Watch the show at Newsmax.com or listen on your favorite radio station. Here's Steve Mossberg. Welcome back. This is the Steve Mossberg Show. I'm David Nelson, of course, filling in for Steve. It's been a few weeks uh, since the close of the Zimmerman trial. We all watched, uh, dominated the airwaves literally 24-7, every media outlet uh, carried it, and of course it was a not guilty verdict. He was not convicted of uh, second degree murder or manslaughter. Really people fell on both sides of this. There were some that praised the verdict saying that justice had been served, uh, that this was in fact uh, justifiable hom homicide. But frankly there were many more who really took the other, the other side of this and uh, even went so far as to say that this was a race or hate crime. Uh, it forced me to, to think about what I wanted to say about this. And while many pundits have been on the air, literally within seconds of the ver verdict being read, it's taken me some time to come to grips with my thoughts about this and my emotions about this and race relations in, in general in America. Uh, I must admit that uh, when uh, President Obama came uh, recently, he was in front of the White House press corps and he came in unannounced. and. Uh, he wanted to speak about the Zimmerman trial and he wanted to give you his thoughts and he wanted to talk about race relations and start a dialogue. I believe he was sincere in his remarks uh, and it made me think, let's go to uh, cut 15 and listen to the president. Another way of saying that is uh, Trayvon Martin could have been me uh, 35 years ago. Those comments made me think and I, I thought back in my past, you know, uh, when I was growing up and it made me come to the, the, the final conclusion that 35 years ago, I was George Zimmerman. Now, I know that's a big statement to make, and you're probably wondering why I would make such a rash statement by, like that. But let me walk you through my, my, my thought process. You know, back then, uh, you know, people think musicians, you become a star overnight. It's not like that at all. Uh, I struggled. I started off at the bottom. I questioned my own uh, worth as a musician. I wasn't sure if I was going to make it. I had no idea. I decided I might have to do something different. I actually thought about becoming a New York City police officer, and I'll explain in a minute how this relates to the whole Zimmerman event, because I think that's something that George Zimmerman went through as well. I think he wanted to become a police officer. I know I certainly did. I went so far as uh, to go out and actually take the civil service exam, along with 50,000 other people. And, I got to tell you that the, the exam itself was, was almost comical because uh, there were 100 questions. I got one wrong, and I, I might share with you the one I got wrong uh, a little later in the program. There were two questions on the test. One uh, was a picture of a clock. The second was a picture of, of a gas gauge, and uh, both were multiple choice, and it was how full is the uh, tank and what time is it. 
that was the, the, the mainstay of the, of the test. But I wanted to learn everything about being a police officer. You don't take the test, get a good grade, and then uh, suddenly you're a police officer. It takes time. As a matter of fact, the process is, is almost a, a year in the making. I had a lot of time to think about it. I was enthralled about everything in becoming a cop. Uh, the badge, it was a symbol of, of, of honor. Uh, the, the, the uniform, command respect. The camaraderie amongst uh, the, uh, the, the police officers uh, within the NYPD. But it was also the gun. I wanted that gun. It was a symbol of power. I wanted to carry a gun. And I was determined to carry a gun, and I went out and bought a gun. And it was legal. I had a carry permit for the state of New York, not New York City. Um, I may have had the uh, training to use a gun, but I certainly didn't have the training to know when to use the gun. And I think that translates really to George Zimmerman as well. I think he was sincere in his efforts. I think he wanted to become a cop. I think he wanted to help people. Uh, he was a wannabe cop. I'll use that word. I was a wannabe police officer as well. Uh, I think he was probably shouldn't have been there, but this was not a race crime. It was not, it was not race and hatred. That had nothing to do with it. Uh, he was probably in fear of his life. And I think both, of, both individuals, Trayvon Martin and him, contributed to this tra tragic event. And what gets lost here is, you know, one person died and another person will live a life of controversy. And we're not helped by the likes of a Reverend Al Sharpton, you know, revving up the civil rights machine to tell you that this is a race crime. We are not in civil rights mode, in civil rights terms, we're not where we were 50, 60 years ago. And then it brings me back to the president. I'm not sure he was well served or he served us well with some of his other comments. Uh, let's, go to cut, uh, let's go to cut 16 and hear what the president had to say. There are very few African American men in this country who haven't had the experience of being followed when they were shopping in a department store. That includes me. There are very, very few African American men who haven't had the experience of walking across the street and hearing uh, the locks click on the doors of cars. I got to tell you, if I'm a white person uh, or a black person, if you own a store, uh, if you own a store and you see somebody that you don't understand in your department store, you might be concerned you're going to follow them. I'm going to do the same thing if it's a white person. And you know what? If I'm sitting in my car, if I see somebody dressed, uh, a black man passing me by and he's dressed well, I'm probably not thinking anything of it. If I see him in a hoodie and he's trying to look threatening and I'm f in fear, of, maybe not in fear of my life, but I'm concerned, I'm locking my door. But you know what? If I see the same thing, a white individual walking by my car, and maybe he's got jailhouse tats, or maybe he looks like a homeless person. I'm locking my car. This is not about race. This is about fear and needing to understand each other. All right, enough of that. I don't want to talk about race anymore. Uh, we've got a great rest of the hour for you. You're listening to The Steve Malsberg Show. We'll be back in uh, just a few minutes. The Steve Malsberg Show. Guys, you've heard about Ageless Male, the natural supplement that helps boost testosterone levels within normal healthy ranges. But now, the best testosterone product is even better. New and improved Ageless Male can help you feel more like you used to in your active life and in your romantic life. Because our upgraded formula has been clinically shown to increase your drive, desire, and performance. That's right, guys. Ageless Male has been clinically shown to boost performance. Cancel your plans this weekend. You're staying in. If you're ready to recapture the drive from your youth, now is the time to try Ageless Mail because it's available risk-free. But you must call now. Just call 1-800-460-9790. Be the guy you used to be. Just call 1-800-460-9790. 1-800-460-9790. One eight hundred four six zero nine seven nine zero. One eight hundred four six zero nine seven nine zero.
Actor portrayal, potential customer experience, your experience will vary. I was overwhelmed with credit card debt, losing sleep, worrying about money all the time. Creditors were hounding me night and day, and I didn't think there was any way I could ever get out of debt or get my life back. Then a friend told me about the Financial Solutions Group, and I found out all it took to get started was one free call. They really helped me get my life back. If you're like I was, you could see almost half or more of your credit card balances eliminated without the nightmare of bankruptcy or attorney's fees. And they didn't charge me any settlement fees till they reduced my debt. If you have more than $10,000 in credit card debt, this is your chance to get your life back. Make one quick free call today, right now, to see if you qualify. 1-800-477-6802. That's 1-800-477-6802. Again, 1-800-477-6802. It's unclear that these speeches are doing much to move. Hello and welcome to your Newsmax Now update. I'm John Bachman. Disheartening news on the economic front. A new survey shows that four out of five Americans struggle with unemployment, are near poverty, or must rely on welfare for at least part of their life. According to the Associated Press, which conducted the survey, the struggles are increasingly crossing racial lines. More than 76% of white adults say they've experienced economic insecurity by the time they turn 60. The AP says the reason for the trends are global economy, the bigger gap between the rich and the poor, and the loss of high-paying manufacturing jobs. Meanwhile, it appears that Congress and the White House could face a showdown over the budget, with Republicans calling for more cuts to domestic spending in order to raise the debt ceiling. But this weekend on the Sunday talk shows, Treasury Secretary Jack Lew said that option is not on the table. Congress needs to get its work done. It needs to fund the kinds of things the American middle class need. And we need to get the debt limit extended in a way that doesn't create a crisis. That is what every Congress needs to do. And Congress needs to do it when it gets back in September. Israel and the Palestinians have agreed to restart preliminary peace talks. The State Department says the meetings will begin later today in Washington, D.C., the last two days, and will focus on developing a roadmap for future negotiations. Both sides agreed to sit down after Israeli leaders said they would release more than 100 Palestinian prisoners. And Pope Francis has just arrived back in Italy after his week-long trip to Brazil, and once again he set a new standard by holding a news conference aboard the flight home. He says he's very happy with his Brazil trip, and why not huge crowds turned out throughout his historic visit. An ocean of Catholics occupied Copacabana Beach Sunday when the Pope held an open-air mass for three million people in Rio de Janeiro. It was one of his last stops on his seven-day homecoming to Latin America after being elected Pope. And his Sunday message clearly inspired the massive crowd, including those who came from far away. The Pope says diminished security allowed him to get close to the people. He says he sometimes feels caged in in the Vatican and would someday like to walk the streets of Rome. And police in France are on the hunt for stolen jewels. $53 million worth of jewelry was taken in Cannes yesterday in a brazen daytime heist at the famous Carlton Hotel. Witnesses say a lone armed robber snatched the precious stones, put them in a briefcase, and then he vanished into the crowd. Detectives say this has all the markings of a professional job. It is the third high-profile jewelry heist in the French Riviera just this year. And next up on your Newsmax Now update, NBC plans a new miniseries based on the life of Hillary Clinton. See which Hollywood leading lady has been tapped to play the former first lady. Plus a Newsmax exclusive with Utah Senator Orrin Hatch. Hear his take on the House's immigration plan next. Obama wants your money, and he's determined to get it. He wants your money to buy up unions, his Wall Street cronies, and to expand the Obama welfare nation. Well, Swiss America is determined to stop him from stealing your money. They want to send you an award-winning film, I Want Your Money, on DVD that exposes his plan. It'll help keep the government's hands off your money using gold, silver, and other hard asset strategies to protect your hard-earned money. Call today and request the DVD, I Want Your Money, normally $19.95, yours absolutely free. Let Swiss America show you how to use gold, silver, and other hard assets to protect your hard-earned money. Call now, 800-978-3907. 
800-978-3907. Call Swiss America right now. Learn all about investing in gold. 800-978-3907. That's 800-978-3907. Call right now. In 2013, half of your friends, family, and neighbors may lose their jobs, all while you are robbed of 90% of your life savings, investments, and home's value. Controversial economist Robert Wiedemer, who was the only expert to predict the recession, has released a startling video with shocking evidence that the powers that be have tried to ban. But that hasn't stopped 50 million people from getting the truth. Watch it at Aftershock911.com. Aftershock911.com. What is Lignet? Lignet is knowledge. Lignet is power. Lignet is global. Top level officials, U.S. intelligence officers, national security advisors, foreign operatives, all reporting directly to you. What is Lignet? Lignet is confidential. Lignet is sensitive. Lignet is security. What is Lignet? They're the ones taking the world's pulse. If you're not in the know, you're not on Lignet.com. You've been briefed. And welcome back. NBC will air a new miniseries focused on the life of Hillary Clinton ahead of a potential presidential run in 2016. The project is set to take place starting back in 1998 towards the end of President Bill Clinton's second term. NBC's president says the miniseries is designed to, quote, shake things up as broadcast audiences have fallen by as much as 7 percent a year. It will star Diane Lane as the former first lady and secretary of state. And it looks like the House will finally take up the immigration reform debate in October. Meanwhile, we talked to Utah Senator Orrin Hatch about the Senate's bill. Hatch says he and his colleagues did a pretty good job, but it's vital the House also pass a plan that appeals to both parties and both chambers. We've got de facto amnesty on 11 million people who don't know what their status is other than their label. And to see more of our exclusive interviews and content, stay with Newsmax.com. This has been your Newsmax Now update for July 29th. I'm John Bachman. Now here's the Steve Malzberg Show in New York. Are you ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live from the Newsmax studios, this is the Steve Malzberg Show. Be a part of the action by calling 855-777-9660. That's 855-777-9660. Or email Steve at malzbergshow at newsmax.com. Here is Steve Malzberg. Welcome back. This is the Steve Malzberg Show. I'm David Nelson. I'm filling in for Steve today. Uh, you know, I, I thank you so much for, for listening to my last piece. I, I wanted to talk about the Zimmerman case, what it meant to me emotionally, and, and what it means uh, really for our nation. And I want to reiterate here, one of the things that I'm upset about, and I'm, I'm carrying this across because it is an important story, is that the civil rights machine led by the Al Sharptons of the world are trying to stir up, you know, race hatred and, the, and trying to tell you that the race relations are where they were, you know, perhaps 50 or 60 years ago. Even the president says we've, we've come a long way, and I respect him for that. He, he did the right, right thing there. I believe he was sincere, sincere in his remarks. I'm not sure it framed the issue uh, as correctly as I would have liked it to have been. And I think it brings us back to that O'Reilly show. I think Bill O'Reilly said some things that a lot of people believe, certainly in white America. And I was surprised to find, in fact, that uh, you know, some African Americans actually believe that a lot can be done within the African community to improve things there. I mean, I'm going to say it again. 90% of all blacks killed in a violent crime are killed by other blacks. Something has to be done in these communities. And I'm going to play the cut one more time because I think it's an important one. Let's go to cut, uh, let's go to cut six. It's Don Lemon from CNN. He's an, an African-American host. Here's what he had to say. But now that the jury has reached his verdict, one that everyone must accept, it's time now for some tough love on the subject. The reason there is so much violence and chaos in the black precincts is the disintegration of the African-American family. This was He's probably the most important in fact that excuse me, I, I ran in there, but this was probably the the most important clip that that's come out all all weekend long. I, it, it really devastated me when I saw that. And he actually had five points. And I want to reiterate, reiterate these five points again for young black people, things that they can do to improve their own community. Let's go to uh, cut five. Because black people, if you really want to fix the problem, here's just five things that you should think about doing. 
Here's number five. And if, if, if this doesn't apply to you, if you're not doing this, then it doesn't apply to you. I'm not talking about you. Here's number five. Pull up your pants. Number four now is the N-word. Now number three. Respect where you live. Number two. Finish school. And number one, and probably the most important, just because you can have a baby, it doesn't mean you should. I think that two of those suggestions that hit me the most is the N-word. It, it surprises me that the, the African-American community uses it as often as they do. They use it with each other. And if a white person uses that word, of course, uh, I, I never will. It, 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 it's a travesty. Don't do it. You know, you don't need it. And the last one, of course, I think is very important, especially for young women, young African-American women. You know, you don't need to have a baby. There, you know, if you're not prepared to have a baby, if you're not prepared to support it, and if you don't have a husband to support it with you, avoid it. Avoid it. I thought it was a, a great piece by uh, Don Lemon, and uh, I applaud him for that. Uh, enough of race. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Let's move on. There were some other things that happened over the weekend. I watched all the talk shows, and uh, I heard a couple of things that actually gave me some encouragement. You've heard me talk incessantly, especially on Money News, about energy independence in, the, in our nation. It's critical. For the first time in perhaps 50 years, we could actually see energy independence in this country perhaps in, say, 10 years. I was even talking, talking to it about it earlier. Uh, interestingly, I mentioned it earlier, there was an article, uh, an interview with Prince Alawid from Saudi Arabia. They're terrified of the fact that we are finding oil in the ground and natural gas in the ground through fracking. Let's go to this Meet the Press video. It's actually a short clip of uh, former, uh, former uh, Representative Ford from the state of Tennessee uh, a Democrat, mind you, talking about the Keystone Pipeline. Let's go to cl clip 12. There are things that can be done outside of what Congress, what, what Congress has to do. For one, I'm a, a firm believer. Approve the Keystone Pipeline. Let's create jobs and create tax revenue for the various states who will be touched by the, the construction of this. That's you'll a create higher-paying jobs. You'll create greater tax revenue. One Amen. Finally, somebody got it right. Somebody got it right especially somebody from the Democratic Party. He's a noted Democrat, uh, a leader in his party. I don't understand why this isn't being done. It is shocking that this is a job creator. Some say as little as 20,000 jobs. On the high side, some say it's 100,000 jobs. If it produces 10,000 jobs, what are we waiting for? I think the, over, the environmental concerns are way overblown, and I think this is nothing more than a political event because... Uh, the president is paying back, and I'm, I'm being honest about this. The president is paying back his constituency. He was supported by the green lobby. They are totally opposed to, uh, to fossil fuel energy in this country. But we are the Saudi Arabia of these products. We have enough coal, uh, natural gas, and oil in the United States. We don't have to import one drop. Uh, that would do wonders for our economy. The other thing that I saw over the weekend is... Uh, some comments, and this was on uh, ABC's uh, George Stephanopoulos uh, show. Uh, they had Peggy Noonan on, and I found this fascinating because the president has been out on the road talking uh, incessantly, uh, getting, trying to get his message out. He's campaigning. I don't understand why he's out there. I, I said it earlier. Uh, somebody should tell him that he won the election. He doesn't need to be out there. It's time to come back home and start doing the hard work. And that means sitting down in the back rooms of Congress you're going to have to deal with these guys. You may not like these guys. You may feel that they're completely against you. But you're going to have to sit down with the Republican Party and hash this stuff out. But here's what Peggy had to say. Let's go to clip 17. Yeah. It's unclear that these speeches are doing much to move public opinion, much less Washington. I noticed that in one of the speeches, it went over an hour. There was a heck of a lot jammed in. That told me something. It said, we're not sure exactly what to say, so we're going to say everything, but a speech about everything is a speech about nothing. Beyond that, I think every president in the intense media environment we have now, certainly every two-term president, gets to a point where the American people stop listening, stop leaning forward hungrily for information. I think this president got there earlier. 
I think he did too. And I, it happens to all presidents, as she said. But I think the president's spending too much time talking and not enough time uh, doing. The other, this is just a lighthearted one, a big uproar uh, about Jane Fonda. And of course, uh, Jane Fonda is Hanoi Jane. We all remember her antics uh, during the Vietnam War. But uh, she's being chastised for, uh, she's about to play Nancy Reagan uh, in an upcoming movie uh, about the President Reagan and, 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 and the First Lady. And some people are appalled that a left winger like, uh, like uh, Hanoi Jane would actually do this. Uh, let's roll uh, clip seven. I want you to hear this. Listen to what she has to say. Don't you worry about Ronnie. I'll take care of that. The idea that I could play Nancy Reagan was just too much to resist. I thought it would be fun to play her. I know people say, oh my gosh, you know, Jane Fonda's playing Nancy Reagan. But I don't think that whatever differences there might be in our politics really, really matters. You know, as an actor, I approach her as a human being. And I happen to know that she's not unhappy that I'm playing her. <laughs> well, the First Lady's not unhappy. I know people are, uh, out there in Radio Land, you can't see this, but what uh, very interesting shirt that uh, uh, Jane Fonda was wearing. Uh, she's wearing a shirt, and on her shirt is a picture of her playing uh, Clute, a uh, fascinating movie. Uh, I, I thought that was, that was kind of comical, a scene there. Of course you should be able to play the First Lady. She's a great actress. What does it matter what her politics are? Do we care what the politics are of, a, uh, of anyone, really, in Hollywood? Most of Hollywood is on the left. They people play people from the right. That's silly. Uh, she should play the part. She'll do a great job in it. We've got a great rest of the hour for you. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. You're listening to The Steve Malzberg Show. I'm David Nelson. We'll be right back. The Steve Malzberg Show. Attention hip implant patients. Are you in constant pain? Have you received a letter from your doctor about your implant? Have you had or need a revision surgery? Do you have high levels of metal, chromium, or cobalt in your blood? Over 90,000 hip implant devices have been recalled due to defects and failures resulting in revision or replacement surgery. If you have a recalled hip implant, you may be entitled to substantial financial compensation. Call 800-460-1530 to see if your implant is affected by the recalls. If you or a loved one has a defective or recalled hip implant, you may be entitled to substantial financial compensation. Call 800-460-1530. That's 800-460-1530. Protect your legal rights today. Call 800-460-1530. This is an advertisement not valid in all states. Paid non-attorney spokesperson. iLawsuit.com is an advertising group that represents lawyers advertising their services and is a free matching service for consumers. It is not a law firm or lawyer referral service. 3 a.m. and you're up again for the third time. It's not just affecting your sleep, it's interrupting your daily life. Frequent trips to the bathroom due to an aging prostate is a common concern, but you can now do something about it with Prostate Revive. Doctor-formulated Prostate Revive is an all-natural dietary supplement packed with 15 powerful ingredients focused on improving prostate health by targeting the two main sources of prostate concerns, rogue testosterone and inflammation. And now, in this limited-time radio offer, you can try Prostate Revive absolutely free. That's a free bottle, a 30-day supply of Prostate Revive, risk-free. Plus, if you call right now, you'll also receive our free report, A Doctor's Guide to a Healthy Prostate. Call now for details on getting your free bottle, plus our doctor's report. Call 1-800-659-REVIVE. That's 1-800-659-REVIVE. Don't be a victim of an aging prostate. Start getting the sleep you need and get your life back with Prostate Revive. Claim your risk-free bottle now at 1-800-659-REVIVE. Revive. If your prostate is giving you problems and your doc says it's just part of getting older, be wary. Renowned physician and author Dr. David Brownstein thinks this is baloney. He's discovered a link between aging and prostate health and believes prostate concerns do not have to be an inevitable part of aging. That's why he created Prostate Revive. Hi, I'm Dr. David Brownstein. I personally formulated Prostate Revive to include the most essential natural ingredients available to help promote a healthy prostate gland and optimal urinary function. The producers of Dr. 
Brownstein's Prostate Revive are so thrilled with the positive feedback from satisfied customers that for a limited time, they are willing to send you your first month's supply free. Plus, call now and you'll also receive Dr. Brownstein's special report, A Doctor's Guide to a Healthy Prostate. For details on getting your free bottle, call 1-800-596-REVIVE. That's 1-800-596-REVIVE. Take control with Prostate Revive. Call now while supplies last to claim your risk-free bottle at 1-800-596-REVIVE. My patients still don't know what Obamacare means for them. And how could they? There are already 13,000 pages of regulations, and the bureaucrats are just getting started. Obamacare will change your health care, and you need to understand how. There are hidden taxes and fines, big cuts in Medicare, even new regulations on what services doctors can offer you. Some businesses could get hit with a 40% additional tax on your health care plan. Please, get the Obamacare Survival Guide today. It's the best book explaining the new law. It's easy to read, everything you need to know to protect yourself, your family, your business. The Obamacare Survival Guide at bookstores everywhere. Special internet only offer right now at Obamacare911.com. Sure, Steve might be a bit of a hypochondriac, but he never gets sick of breaking, breaking news. news. This is the Steve Malzberg Show. Call Steve at 1-855-777-9660. That's 1-855-777-9660. Here's Steve. Welcome back to the Steve Malzberg Show. I'm David Nelson filling in for Steve. You know, we've been talking about it the whole show. We've been talking about uh, President Obama... Uh, being out on the uh, right out on tour, uh, out campaigning, talking about uh, almost everything, talking about the economy. He's also included in his stops. He's been uh, stopping at colleges. He spoke at the University of Missouri. I think I have that correct. And at that university, there were 10 Republicans that, that were denied access to the speech. They were wearing Tea Party shirts. They weren't carrying placards. Uh, they were told to stand hundreds of yards away from the event. They had tickets for the event which was uh, kind of interesting. They were told they couldn't come in, that they were a security threat. I'd like to find out why they were a security uh, threat. Uh, Christopher w uh, White, I believe that, if that's correct. I, uh, sorry about that, Chris. Christopher White uh, wrote an article for The College Fix where he's a contributor talking about the incident. Chris, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, you're very welcome, Dave. Chris, uh, the, uh, you're having me on. Uh, I understand. Were you at the event yourself? I was not at the event. Uh, it was at the University of Central Missouri, and that is at uh, that is in Warrensburg, Missouri. That's about that's about an hour away from uh, the University of Missouri in Columbia. Okay, I had that uh, wrong. So it was the University of okay. Central Missouri. Let let me understand this. If I understand this correctly, is the way I'm laying it out correct? I mean, you've got ten people, uh, you know, wanted to attend the event. Uh, ten college students. Uh, they were obviously Republicans. They were re wearing Tea Party shirts. I don't think they were doing anything threatening. The Secret Service told them that, uh, that the event was full, full at capacity. First of all, two questions. One, if it's full, why would, why would they even have tickets if it was full? Who got in in front of them? And number two, was the event really full? Should they have been let in? I have no idea whether the event was really full. All, all we know is that the, uh, the Secret Service agent, who uh, fairly certain it was a Secret Service agent, because the University of Missouri did not uh, uh, said that he was not a member of the University, uh, uh, the University of Central Missouri campus police. And uh, as far as I know, he's not a Warrensburg police officer. And I couldn't imagine a rent -a cop being a uh, be guarding the uh, the, uh, the building in which the president was speaking in. So. He did say that uh, regardless as to whether the person, uh, it didn't matter whether the person, uh, the group were Democrats or Republicans, that, that he had a uh, mission to make certain that the president was uh, secure and safe. He didn't say that, the, uh, that they couldn't come in because the event was over capacity. Okay. Every event, all the tickets were accounted for, because obviously all the tickets were not accounted for. The six, it was, there were six uh, uh, college Republicans are that's that's one uh, that's a small that's a minor mistake there weren't 10 they did have 10 tickets but there were only six uh, college okay Republicans so there's six right. individuals with with 
10 tickets, so uh, it That's doesn't right. sound like it was full. They had, full, they had full. more tickets than they, what they were, they were, they were supposed <laughs> so to So it doesn't sound like it was a capacity. They were actually told that they, no. they had to actually go and stand several hundred yards away uh, from the event. I, I don't know. Intuitively, intuitively, I feel you know they just don't want hecklers there. I, I don't. Was there any inclination? Was there any evidence that these people were going to stand up and hold signs or rush the stage? Anything like that? Well, the uh, college Republicans had uh, earlier than day and in, in the day uh, had been relegated to a public or a quote unquote free speech area. So the rest of the campus was not free speech. I just have one little section was uh, was the free speech area in which they can voice their opinion. So they had been standing in that area and hey, they had been protesting and they had been carrying signs and they had been uh, they had been chanting, they had been talking to people as a, as they walked by. So I'm fairly certain that the Secret Service were were well aware of their uh, of their their uh, uh, their existence on the uh, on the campus on the campus at that on that day. But there were other protesters in the uh, in the uh, area now. Most of the protesters who were there at the uh, event were not allowed on campus at all. They were barred from being on campus. They had to be outside of campus. They could not even step foot on the uh, uh, campus. If they did, they were arrested or they would be arrested. You know, Chris, I, I want to spend a, a little time with you because it isn't often that I get somebody that's in, so in tune with what's going on in the college community and it relates to some of what the president obviously talked about in, in his speech before the University of Central Missouri. It relates to Obamacare. And frankly, uh, a lot of the burden of Obamacare is going to be put on the backs of young people. And frankly, many of those coming out of college. I wonder what college students coming out of college think about all this, because they're going to have to subsidize the cost for the older generation and the sick who can't afford it. Do you get any feedback from them? That's true. Uh, that was that was a part of their. That was one of their main concerns. Uh, the the college Republicans themselves. That's that, that was their primary concern when, in protesting was uh, the uh, the cost of uh, Obamacare, uh, and the uh, the another another big concern here in the uh, in Missouri is the 16 uh, percent unemployment rate among uh, youngsters, college age students, getting out of college. They, uh, the 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 unemployment rate skyrocketing. It's sky high. And uh, the obviously the president hasn't really made any inroads uh, in lowering precipitously the uh, the unemployment rate at all. Really, he's I guess knocked it down uh, a percent or two. But that is uh, I mean with with all of the with all of the gains in uh, <laughs> the <laughs> from sixteen debt, to fourteen and the deficit, does... it seems it doesn't seem uh, commensurate with the the lack in uh, uh, the lack in jobs. Well, it, it brings up another issue that I wanted to ask you about because a lot of these students, of course, have student loans, and there's been a lot of controversy about uh, the, the level of debt that college students are taking on and the jobs that are out there, and and some have even penned books like uh, Bill Bennett saying that you know asking the question, the hard question is college, college worth it? You know, you, these students are piling on an awful lot of debt. There's not a lot of confidence coming out of school uh, to get jobs. You know, I've often thought, Chris, that, you know, if, if you don't have an idea of, of, of what you want to do and you, you haven't really firm, formalized what you want to be in your life, that the concept of a liberal arts education, just kind of, I'll find myself in school, uh, isn't going to do the answer. Any thoughts for just a quick 30 seconds on why, uh, on, on what college students are feeling right now leaving the universities? I did. I penned an article for the College Fix a couple of, I think, a couple, it was about a month ago about the about this issue about the cost, the rising cost of uh, of, of school loans, and you know, just the subs the subsidizing of uh, school loans by the uh, federal government is just increasing the uh, is is making uh, is bloating the student population within colleges because it's making it easier for you to for students a college degree or get into college to get a degree. So it's just bloating them. They, they don't know what to do, so they're going well. You know, like you said, I think you've got it right. Uh, I, I think you've got it right, Chris. I, I think you've got it right, Chris. I, I think that they are confused about it. We're gonna have to leave it right there. Thank you so much for calling in. That, of course, was uh, Chris White from the College Fix. We'll be right back. The Steve Malsberg Show. 
Bad credit card debt happens to good people. Credit card companies lure you in with low introductory rates or low minimum payments, and before you know it, you owe thousands of dollars in credit card debt. It has happened to millions of good people just like you. But here's the good news. Thanks to a powerful program now approved, anyone with $2,000 or more in credit card debt can cut their credit card payments up to half and even reduce or eliminate interest charges altogether. That's right. Our nationwide nonprofit program is helping U.S. residents cut their credit card payments. Call 800-613-3159 now. The call and information are free. We've helped over half a million people with their credit card debt, and now we can help you. Call 800-613-3159 to see how this powerful nonprofit program can work for you. Bad credit card debt happens to good people. Get free of credit card debt today. Call 800-613-3159. That's 800-613-3159. Again, 800-613-3159. Max Magazine is proud to present a special tribute to our 40th president, Ronald Reagan. It's a very special documentary and commemorative issue of Newsmax Magazine celebrating the centennial of President Reagan's birth. First, here's a video clip from the award-winning documentary, Rendezvous with Destiny. We're in the midst of a springtime of hope for America. You ain't seen nothing yet. This is of an evil empire. Tear down this wall. I believe that together we can keep this rendezvous with destiny. In the next several minutes, you will learn things about President Ronald Reagan that you've never seen, heard, or read before. Welcome to today's special Newsmax event celebrating the life and legacy of President Reagan. During this historic presentation, we will commemorate President Reagan's storied life. We'll revisit his two terms in office and recollect his proudest achievements and greatest challenges. Ronald Reagan's life reads like a fairy tale of success stories. He was an accomplished athlete, an honored veteran, a famous actor, the governor of California, and of course, our nation's 40th president. He called himself a citizen politician, and only in politics when he won, government was gaining too much power. By then he was age 54, with a successful career behind him. Twice elected President of the United States, Ronald Wilson Reagan was a contradiction to some, once a Democrat, then a Republican, a champion of smaller government whose own government grew, a fiscal conservative who failed to balance the budget. His critics mistook his affability for weakness, but behind the smile and the charm existed an extraordinary leader with unique skills and bold and revolutionary ideas. We only had time to share just a few of the top defining moments in Ronald Reagan's presidency, but you'll get to see them all in Rendezvous with Destiny. By the way, the president's close relationship with the Pope is especially fascinating. You'll also learn how dealing with an alcoholic father helped shape Reagan's ability to negotiate. And if you ever wondered what the leader of the free world likes to get for the holidays, well, you'll find that out as well. So let's review today in this free offer. We are sending you a copy of Ronald Reagan, Rendezvous with Destiny, and the collector's limited edition of our issue commemorating the 100th anniversary of President Reagan's birth. Right now, when you subscribe to Newsmax Magazine, you can own both the DVD and receive the special Reagan 100th birthday commemorative edition. That's $25 in bonus gifts when you subscribe. Go to Newsmax.com backslash Reagan13 to subscribe today. Join the millions who read Newsmax magazine every month. This is not your typical Scream Fest talk show. No. 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 This is the next generation of talk radio. Here is Steve Malsberg. Welcome back. I'm David Nelson. This is, of course, the Steve Malsberg Show. It's been a lot of fun today. You know, we all saw the uh, news break out uh, just, uh, I guess, been in the last uh, week or so, uh, what happened in Detroit, the Detroit bankruptcy. Uh, it was, of course, decades in, in the making. This just didn't happen overnight. Uh, it was very interesting to see uh, Michigan Governor uh, Rick Schneider go before the cameras and say the following. Uh, let's go to that cut right now.
Okay, we're gonna we're gonna try to find that cut for you. That uh, we're looking for Rick Snyder. Got it. What's the rationale and what's the impact for both the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan? Well, let me start with the fact that this is a situation that's been 60 years in the making in terms of the decline of Detroit. From a financial point of view, let me be blunt: Detroit's broke. Detroit is broke, and we'll have to see how this unfolds. But joining us with a more uplifting story about Detroit, and he believes that there's maybe a, a, a silver lining behind this dark cloud, is uh, Richard Harwood of the Harwood uh, Institute.org. Richard, thanks so much for calling in. David, it's good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Richard, I read your article. It was uplifting at points, and, and the attitude that the city uh, is really going to be saved. But, but a critic would point out the following, you know, First, you need a, a real action plan here. I mean, there are billions in debt. I believe it's 18 billion in debt. You're, you're somehow kind of painting that not all is uh, bad. Walk me through your thought process. What's good here? Well, look, I mean, there's no question, as you said, there are 18.5 billion in debt. It takes 58 minutes for a, a police officer to uh, respond on average to a call. Uh, city services have been cut. There's there's a lot of bad things happening in Detroit, but one of the things that I look for in thinking about whether or not communities are uh, coming back is uh, pockets of change, and we're seeing them throughout uh, the city of Detroit. There's more investment downtown. There are businesses like Quicken Loans, which have relocated there. Uh, there's a new venture capital fund of $50 million for local startups. Um, it's clear that the, the vast majority of people in Detroit, their lives are not good right now. But there are uh, these pockets of change that give us a sense of hope that actually the community can come back and that good things can uh, be built upon. I think you bring up an important point. You mentioned that Quicken Loans, and I know the company well, that they are, that they are uh, you know, opening up business. They are opening up, up shop there. So from a business perspective, it would seem that Detroit would have to do something to attract business. Are they going to do things like tax incentives to help uh, bring all these businesses in? Because they're not going to come in on their own. Yeah, well, I think they've done some of that. I think the other thing that you're starting to see in, in Detroit and Michigan are more graduates of state universities staying uh, in state because they believe that there are more opportunities there. When you listen to entrepreneurs talk about Detroit, they, they say they want to be part of, of the turnaround. But there needs to be more than that, obviously. And I think uh, the uh, uh, Mr. Orr, who is uh, is guiding the the community through bankruptcy, is is laid out a plan. Uh, it's going to cost a, uh, over a billion dollars um, to fix streetlights. You know, 40 percent of the streetlights in Detroit don't work. Uh, there aren't enough parks that are operating in Detroit, and and more are slated for closing. So there are all sorts of economic uh, incentives that need to be had. There's a uh, uh, a new labor pool that's growing, and there are city services that are going to have to be restored, and not only restored, but improved, in order for people to believe not only that Detroit's a good investment, but that's a place where you'd want your employees to work, and it's a place where you might even want to live. That's an important point, and I, I want to go to that next, because there's been a mass exodus uh, of, uh, of citizens from the, from the city of Detroit, Many live in the suburbs, but the city has declined dramatically over the last few, few decades. What are they going to do to, to prevent the exodus uh, from accelerating or even getting worse? Well, you know, what I've seen, you're right, you know, the, the uh, uh, population of Detroit's gone from some 2 million people to about 700,000 right now. And, and again, I think what people look for in communities in order to stay and to raise their children um, are, uh, are their jobs, yes, but I think it's more than that. It's uh, are there good services? Are the schools starting to be turned around? Do we believe we can make a life here? And do we believe that this community, uh, that people here are connected, that they care about the community, that they want to be here? I think Detroit has some of those ingredients. They're missing a lot of them. But again, I think the thing that we need to look at right now is you could declare Detroit dead uh, right now if you're looking at certain numbers and statistics. Or you could also say that amid the bankruptcy, amid the problems that the community is having, that there are pockets of hope starting to emerge, that there is a reason to believe that the community might be able to come back over time. You know, Kevin Orr is the, uh, is the emergency manager, manager of Detroit. He's taken over the bankruptcy. He seems to understand the gravity of the problem. Uh, let's go to cut eight. I'd like you to listen to this, Richard, and hear what he has to say. 
Uh, one thing I would say is we've operated on the assumption that we have to cure this process, this problem on our own. We are not expecting the cavalry to come charging in. We're out here in an outpost and we have to fix it because we dug this hole. Hope is not a strategy from my perspective. I can't plan on the basis of what may or may not happen or what help may or may not come. I have to deal with realities and externalities on the ground right now. He seems to understand the gravity of the problem, and it is a serious problem. They're going to have to start finding ways to bring in cash. And one of the things that's been mentioned, and I wanted you to comment on this as well, is they, they seem to have a treasure trove of art. Uh, let's listen to this one last cut, uh, Richard. I'd like you to listen to this. We're going to go to cut uh, three. This is uh, from CBS News, where they're talking about the amount of art that could be sold. I'd like to know what you think about this. Let's go to cut Detroit three. Detroit is home to one of the most prestigious collections of art in the world, and one of the options on the table is for all of that to be sold. But now the city is talking about selling everything from works by Van Gogh to Picasso to the original Howdy Doody doll. Kevin Orr says all assets must be on the table to appease the city's creditors. Experts consulted by the Detroit Free Press valued the works at two and a half billion dollars. That's a lot of money. The Howdy Doody doll. I forgot about the Howdy Howdy, howdy Doody That's doll. Right. Uh, are they going to be able to sell this art, and and will it uh, help? Well, I think they've got to be careful here. It, it is. It is true that all assets need to be put on the table, and they need to examine all of them and, and the value of them. But I think it might be penny-wise and pound-foolish for them to start selling off these, uh, uh, these oil paintings and other assets that they have, uh, particularly at the Detroit Institute of the Arts. You know, those are cultural assets of a community. When communities rebound, when people think about moving to communities, the cultural assets of a community become very important, whether they be um, art or parks or other kinds of things that round out our lives and make our lives meaningful and make a community uh, what it is. So I hope they don't rush too quickly to sell off those paintings and other artifacts that they have. But, Richard, I, I, I got to interject here for a second. I'm a financial yeah. guy, all right? They've got to raise money from somewhere. This seems like a, a found opportunity for them because at some point in time, they're going to have to come back to the financial markets. And the municipal bond market has been devastated. Uh, obviously, those bondholders have been hit very hard. Now, Kevin Orr has come out and said that he thinks they'll be able to go back to the capital markets. I don't know if they're going to be able to do that. I would think cleaning up their balance sheet, while it's not a lot of money, it, it's something. Why not use it? I realize the Howdy Doody doll is important, but is it really <laughs> that important? Well, I don't know about the Howdy Doody doll, but, but look. Well, wait know. a second. The Howdy Doody doll, that's... <laughs> For me, that's bigger than Van Gogh. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe you should go after it then. But the, the uh, look, you know, uh, communities are, as you know, communities in part are made up of their financial statements, and Detroit's going to have to work on that. And as I said, all assets have to be put on the table. But communities are made up of their culture, of their people, of their history, of their heritage. And I think Detroit needs to try to hang on to those things so that as it turns the corner, it can build on them and use them to lure people back into the community, whether they're residents or tourists or, or businesses, um, because that's part of the civic health and the civic culture of a community, which is vital to any community trying to come back from where Detroit is. That's well said, Richard. Uh, we're going to have to leave it right there. Thank you so much for, for taking the time today. Good to be with you. Thank you. That was, of course, Richard Harward uh, from the Harward uh, Institute.org. Uh, joining us uh, by phone. There's a lot that Detroit can do. They are making some steps. They, they have to attract business. I, I think that's a good thing. They are going to have to put in tax incentives. That's the way to go. Uh, uh, do this in a way to get the businesses in. The jobs will follow the businesses. They are doing some things. You heard that Quicken Loans is now setting up shop there. I actually read in the paper today, I found this kind of interesting. They're trying to attract uh, Hollywood, and they've succeeded. The Transformers... Uh, uh, franchise, one of the a very popular movies, certainly for kids, are set up shop right now this summer. They're filming right through August in Detroit. I think that's just wonderful. I think that's the kind of thing you need to do to attract new business there. And uh, I hope they continue to do that. But for me, you know, I've been watching this unfold for perhaps, you know, 30 years. Uh, a lot of this really comes down to uh, a left-leaning mentality uh, a union-leaning mentality because, like it or not, uh, President Obama may have saved you know, the car companies. He certainly didn't save Detroit. 
It was the unions that backed President Obama that actually destroyed those car companies in the first place. The incentives that they got, the, uh, the health care packages that they got. As a matter of fact, one of the options right now is to put those health care packages in Obamacare. Nobody wants it. They don't want it. They want something better. They want to keep what they have. I don't think they're going to be able to do that. They're going to have to give in something. We'll be right back in a few minutes with Bethany McLean. You're listening to The Steve Malsberg Show. I'm David Nelson. Thanks for joining. The Steve Malsberg Show. In 2013, half of your friends, family, and neighbors may lose their jobs, and you may be forced to watch helplessly as you are robbed of 90% of your life savings, all while your home's value is eradicated. Controversial economist Robert Wiedemer believes we will soon stare down a secret crisis that will rival the Great Depression. It was Wiedemer's 2005 book, America's Bubble Economy, that warned of coming meltdowns in our housing and stock markets. Washington did not heed his call, and folks on Main Street lost $50 trillion from the recession. His New York Times best-selling book, Aftershock, predicted our federal debt and dollar would be the next bubbles to burst. And now Robert Wiedemer has released a startling video with shocking evidence the powers that be have tried to ban. But that hasn't stopped 50 million people from getting the truth. Join us at Aftershock2013.com. Aftershock2013.com. Here's today's silver shortage update from Lear Capital. Reports keep coming. The shortage is growing. Twice already this year, the U.S. Mint has run out. Last time this happened, the silver price jumped 40%. It's time to take advantage with this special offer from Lear Capital. For a limited time, buy 20 new silver polar bear coins and get one free. The only 1.5 ounce coin on the market. It's minted with the finest silver, carries a government guarantee, and is eligible for IRAs. The Silver Polar Bear is available exclusively from Lear Capital. But don't wait. Silver supplies are shrinking and availability is not guaranteed. This offer is limited to a minimum purchase of $5,000. Call right now. 800-634-0482. 800-634-0482. Call Lear Capital now. 800-634-0482. Are payday loans ruining your life? If you have two or more payday loan cash advances, listen closely. You may be eligible for a program that payday loan companies don't want you to know about. This program will get payday loan companies out of your bank account and put an end to the payday loan nightmare. Call for free information and find out if Payday Loan Support Center is right for you. Payday loan companies usually trap you into paying rates as high as 700%. We understand payday lenders' tactics. Don't let them take advantage of you anymore. All you need is two or more payday loans to qualify. We can help even if you're behind in collections or have bad credit. Internet payday loans qualify for this program as well. So call 800-250-5084. That's 800-250-5084. The call is free and the consultation is free. Don't miss out. Call for your free information on payday loan relief. 800-250-5084. That's 800-250-5084. Again, 800-250-5084. If you are successful at what you do, whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, a business owner, or you have a great career, you understand the concept of protecting yourself. Well, are you protecting yourself, your family, and your assets with quality term life insurance? Consider these possible rates. A man age 45, non-tobacco user, could obtain $1 million of coverage for as little as $75 a month. And this rate is fixed for the next 10 years. We specialize in policy policies of $500,000 and above. A man age 50, non-tobacco user, may be able to obtain $500,000 of coverage for as little as $115 a month. And this rate is fixed for the next 20 years. We have great rates for smokers too. Call the Term Lifeline now. 800-430-1309. 800-430-1309. According to the FBI Uniform Crime Report, there are over 5,000 robberies every day. Your home could be at risk of being burglarized. 
Don't put your loved ones and valuables in jeopardy. For just over a dollar per day, your home can be protected from break-ins, fire, and more. Get the latest home security technology from Protect Your Home, your ADT authorized dealer. Over 6 million households sleep better at night with ADT monitored home security. What's more, Protect Your Home is offering you their latest equipment, an $850 value, absolutely free for qualified customers. Protect your loved ones and home today. Call now for licenses and to find out more. The call is free, 1-800-949-8201. That's 1-800-949-8201. Again, 1-800-949-8201. $99 installation charge, 36-month monitoring agreement at $36.99 per month. Payment by credit card or electronic bank account charge. For new homeowner customers with satisfactory credit history only. Local permit fees may be required. Certain restrictions apply. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Microphones hot. Satellite link established. Studio lights illuminated. Cameras rolling. Audio and video encoders firing ones and zeros. Internet stream. Um, is streaming. The most technology-advanced radio show is on the air. Here's the captain of this enterprise, Steve Malsberg. Welcome back, everyone. This is, of course, the Steve Malsberg Show. I'm David Nelson filling in for Steve. The Justice Department uh, last week launched a major change in strategy against uh, hedge fund firm SAC Capital and their iconic leader, Stevie Cohen. He's often thought of as the uh, poster child of the hedge fund in industry. What's different this time is they're actually going after the firm. The last time they were merely going after individuals. And some like myself believe that this could be the last nail in the coffin for SAC. So let's talk to someone who's uh, very good at rooting out uh, what's going on in Wall Street. Bethany McLean is a contributing editor to Vanity Fair and also co-author co of the iconic book Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room. Bethany, welcome. Thank you so much for calling in today. Sure. Thanks for having me on. Bethany, I I'm going to go right for the money shot here. In the end, are we going to see Stevie Cohen do a perp walk? <laughs> I, it is not looking likely right now, and let me back up to explain why that is. Uh, the Friday before the Justice Department brought these charges against Steve Cohen's firm, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, brought a, a civil case against um, Steve Cohen personally, and they charged him with failure to supervise two employees who have been accused of, of insider trading. Now, failure to supervise is a pretty weak charge. What that basically means is that the civil authorities did not have enough ammunition to bring an insider trading case against Steve Cohen. The burden of proof in civil cases is lower than it is in criminal cases. So if the civil authorities didn't have enough evidence to bring an insider trading case directly against Steve Cohen, then the criminal authorities definitely didn't. And so that's why you saw the Justice Department bring charges against Cohen's firm rather than Cohen personally. Well, I have to admit, uh, Stevie didn't look too worried this weekend. He apparently had a party through a very big party in a $60 million estate out in East Hampton. Uh, I think one store owner said he bought $2,000 worth of uh, tuna. That sounds like Stevie, but isn't there a change in the case now that uh, we have a rollover of uh, Richard Lee? You know, it, and that is the caveat to all of this, is that, um, it, is that there are a couple people, not so much Richard Lee, because if he had anything that could implicate Cohen directly, then I think he would have done it, and he would have seen a different set of charges brought. Um, but there are two people who, who it, at least theoretically, could implicate Cohen. One is um, Matt Martoma, who was, who was charged in a waiting trial this fall, and another is a very close lieutenant of Steve Cohen's named Mike Steinberg, who's also been charged. Right now, both of those guys are pleading not guilty. Were they to change their pleas and flip on, on Cohen, assuming they could, assuming they have anything on him, then you could see this case change in, in an instant. Some are projecting that they're good, we might start to see a brain drain from uh, SAC as one by one some of their top people maybe decide that it's maybe time to get out of the firm. And I would think, you know, large institutions who might have money placed with SAC, you know, the publicity is very damaging. At some point, you've you got to stay out of the limelight and you've got to pull your capital. Isn't there going to be a capital run on the firm? 
Well, most institutions have already pulled their money. I think the SAC has down some $5 billion in capital so far this year, and I would think that um, other investors are going to have to pull theirs for exactly the reasons that you mentioned, but most of the money in, in SAC is Cohen's own, own fortune. So there will not be a capital run on the firm because most, most of the money is his. And secondly, SAC invests in highly liquid stocks, so this is not a highly leveraged hedge fund that's invested in long-dated illiquid instruments. This is a moderately leveled, leveraged hedge fund that could sell its investments tomorrow because they're all, they're all, they're all stocks. So I don't think you're going to see a, a run on the bank. You, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure investor capital is, is safe. They trade in very uh, liquid securities, as you've pointed out in the past. But how important is this email we hear so much about? Apparently there was an email uh, that went to at least one of his portfolio managers. It was proprietary information, perhaps even insider information. And the question is whether or not Stevie Cohen himself actually read this email. At some point in time, isn't it likely somebody's going to come out of this firm and say, yeah, I showed it to him? Well, <laughs> you know, you would, you, would, you would think so, and that's the interesting, I guess, gap is the right way to put it in this case, is that the Justice Department alleges that the insider trading at SAC was perverse, per pervasive and on a perverse, pervasive, and on an unprecedented scale in, in, in the industry. So if that were the case, you'd think there would be multiple people at SAC who co could come forward and say, the guy's guilty, but you haven't seen any of them yet. So does that mean that there is no insider trading at SAC and that the Justice Department has overreached? Does that mean that the people who work there have made a ton of money because they've worked there and they're incredibly loyal to Cohen and they know where their bread is buttered? Or does that mean everything could change in, in, in an instant? And so there, there's still lots of scenarios that could play out. I guess this is going to play out for some time. I want to take you uh, for a moment to an article that you wrote just the other day, and I, I picked this up off of Reuters. And one, one thing you wrote that really struck me, the notion that individual investors could compete with big institutions in the stock market. Is that really a folly? Is that really, you know, out of the question? Well, it's not whether it's out of the question that you can compete or not, but it is out of the question. It is, there's no question it's not a level playing field. And I get a little bit annoyed when I hear authorities bringing insider trading charges and saying we want to make the playing field level for everybody. It's not level. It never, never has been and it never will be. And I personally think it's somewhat of a, of a crime, and I use that word in the moral sense, not in the legalistic sense, to pretend that there is a, a level playing field. When you look at the access to, to information, that institutional investors and particularly hedge funds have, and you think about the amount of time that smart people are spending trying to ferret out detailed bits of information, it's, 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 just, it's, it's not a level playing field. And you think about the way information travels within these very small contained circles where everybody who's friendly at a certain level will know that there are rumors that such and such company is a fraud. But, Bethany, other... don't, don't we have to protect against that? I understand that it's not a level playing field, and, and nor should it be. You know, these right. you know, these traders I'm not arguing and these the traders and these money managers put in a tremendous amount of time studying their craft and they're frankly they're very good but we have to draw the line somewhere and I would think insider trading is a place we've got to really draw a line firmly in the sand I'm not saying there shouldn't be shouldn't be a line drawn. You can't have a whole theoretical argument about insider trading and what the damage is. I happen to believe it's against the law. And yes, we should draw a line somewhere. And some of the cases that the government have brought to me are just and to other people in the industry are just clearly if insider trading is it can be a gray, murky area, these cases are clearly in the black. They well, clearly are insider trading. And so I'm I'm not arguing against having brought these cases. I'm just arguing don't think it makes the playing field level. I couldn't agree more, Bethany. Bethany, thank you so much. So much for being with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Editor of Vanity Fair and also uh, author of the iconic book, uh, The Smartest Guys in the Room, uh, the story about Enron. I think the SAC Capital uh, story is going to be with us. I, I agree with most of what Bethany is saying, but I think this is not going to be over until uh, Stevie Cohen does a perp walk, walk as I said at the beginning of the uh, of this interview. I, I think this is what the Justice Department wants, and I think it's going to be very difficult for Stevie as time goes on, because one by one they seem to be getting people from his firm, and what happens, you know, you're, you're faced with an indictment, you're faced with years in prison, you're going to roll over. And I think that's in fact what's going to happen. I think Stevie Cohen will end up doing the perp walk.
All right. You've been listening to the Steve Malsberg Show. I'm David Nelson. It's been a lot of fun today. We had a great show. We're going to have a great show tomorrow as well. Thanks for joining. We'll be back tomorrow. See you then.